Just as an FYI, I do not have the first deputation in the room yet. Ah. Okay, well, we got a couple of minutes, so. Yeah. I'm going to other people. If we don't have the first one, we'll start with the second. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me know when we're rolling. We are live. Just as an FYI, I do not have the first no. deputation in the room. Okay, yet. we've got. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. Uh, I'll call the meeting to order. Due to COVID-19, this meeting is being held electronically via Zoom. Public is able to follow and participate in the meeting electronically. Members of the public who wish to provide comments uh, on an agenda item uh, can do so by contacting clerks at pecounty.on.ca by noon of the date preceding the meeting. We'll begin this council meeting by acknowledging that the county Prince Edward is on traditional land that has been inhabited by indigenous peoples from the beginning. We thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to the land. Today, the county of Prince Edward is still home to many First Nations and Métis people and we are grateful to have an opportunity to meet here, work, and continue stewardship of the land. Uh, good evening, everyone. On behalf of members of council and our municipal staff, thank you for joining us electronically for this meeting of council. Your patience and cooperation are appreciated during this ongoing time of uncertainty and this new normal for Prince Edward County Council meetings. This special meeting of council was called for the purpose of discussion and adoption of the draft official plan. Tonight's agenda lists all the items before council for consideration. The recommended motions on tonight's agenda are shown in boldface and copies of the agenda have been posted on our website. This meeting is being live streamed and a participation in the meeting's proceedings will become part of the public record. The recording from the meeting will be published on the county's website immediately and can be viewed by selecting streaming on the bottom right of the county's homepage at thecounty.ca. Your name will be included in the council minutes and form part of the public record posted to the county's website. We have five deputations and one comment from the audience this evening. When you speak, please state your full name and address your comments to the chair. Following your deputation, there may be questions from members of council. If you are following the meeting over YouTube, please mute or pause the video before it's your turn to speak to stop feedback interference. Bylaws listed on this agenda provide the uh, force of law to decisions of council. Any matter decided today by either resolution or bylaw is final and cannot be revisited by council until four regular meetings have expired with a two third majority vote. As to other matters of housekeeping, if I could ask everyone to turn off or mute uh, cell phones. <clears throat> With that, we will move to uh, item three, confirmation of the agenda. Could I have a mover and a seconder for that, please? Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Prinzen. Councillor Roberts. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is uh, Roberts Prinzen motion that the agenda for the special council meeting of February 24, 2021 be confirmed. Thank you, all those in favor? Oh, that carries, thank you. Item four, disclosure of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Does anyone have anything they wish to declare? Seeing none, we'll move to announcements. Does anybody have anything to, uh, to announce? Okay, I have a couple of things. I want, this is gonna be something of a break from protocol, but I want to again, thank Councilor Prinzen for the statement he made last night about Agriculture Day. <clears throat> we um, should have done a better job in recognizing that and that will be undertaken for next year. But thank you very much, Councilor Prinzen for pointing out this, the, the uh, significance of the day and recognizing all those in our community that contribute to our agricultural community. Uh, so, uh, we will move on to deputations, and as I say, we have five. Uh, Chad, have we got the first one, Rosalind Adams, with us at this point? Uh, 
through the chair. Um, I think she is phoned in with her phone number. I'm going to let in the only person I don't recognize in the waiting room. So um, hopefully. Okay, if you could confirm it's her, otherwise we will go on to uh, the second one until she. Okay, we'll go on, we'll on to Amy Bodman then. <laughs> okay, Amy, are you with us? Not yet. She's here. Oh, there you are. Hi, Amy. Thanks for taking the time to come and uh, talk to council. Just if I could ask you if you've got YouTube on to turn it off so we don't get feedback. And a reminder that you've got 10 minutes and there may be questions from members of council. Okay, Mayor Ferguson, I just want to point out that I can't get the YouTube live stream. So I think a lot of people are trying to watch this and aren't being able to watch it. So I had no idea where we were and was trying to email Chad to find out. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Um, okay. But if you'd like me to start my uh, deputation. Um, I'd well, like to well, share my, oopsie, go ahead. Yeah, just, just one sec, Amy. Okay. Uh, Chad, we are live on YouTube. We are live on YouTube, yes. So it is, Okay. as far, so, as, far as we know, it is up and running. Okay, because I even searched the live stream council meeting YouTube link through the county website and couldn't get it. So, and I've always managed to get it before. So it just surprised me. So I'm just letting you know that. Yeah. Okay, just just one sec, Amy. Councillor Bailey, have you got something to add about YouTube? It's on upstairs. Okay. It, it is on, okay. Okay, great. So I'm right. gonna, oopsie. So Amy, the floor yeah. is yours for 10 minutes. Okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen, which will take me a moment. Is that all right? Sure. Absolutely. Okay, okay thanks. Um, okay, hello, my okay. name is Amy Bodman. And I, oopsie, you ready? Is that okay? Go Can ahead. Everybody hear me? Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Hello, my name is Amy Bodman and I live in Wellington. Today I'm speaking on behalf of the South Shore Joint Initiative, the Prince Edward County Field Naturalists, and the Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory. We thank the mayor and council for receiving our deputation and the planning staff for the enormous amount of work that they have done on this draft official plan. Our organizations want to express our support for the following policies that have been included in this plan. We support the notion of concentrating development in settlement areas and recognize the need for development including development that provides low income housing and is within walking distance of amenities. We support the decision to limit severances to one severance per lot in all areas, especially due to the fact that our aquifers are highly susceptible to depletion. We support staff's decision to create a Prince Edward County specific terms of reference environmental impact study template. We support staff's decision to conduct a shoreland study before settling on shorelands designation, placement, and definition. We especially support the addition of a natural heritage system protected for the long term, made up of natural core areas and their linkages. This natural heritage system protects our natural infrastructure, the natural components that recharge our groundwater and improve our water quality by using living nature to remove toxins from it, that protect us from the effects of erosion, both from flowing water and blowing wind, that mitigate the effects of extreme flooding and extreme drought, and that provide increasingly rare habitat for fish and wildlife, supporting the county's recreation industry and improving the health of our bays and lakes. Unlike our built infrastructure, which is enormously expensive to build and maintain. Our natural infrastructure, our natural heritage system does all of this infrastructure work for free as long as you protect it. I know you all have been going over how expensive it is to put in infrastructure into Wellington. Our natural heritage system also incorporates the county's astoundingly beautiful natural features, 
features that attract residents to live here and tourists to visit, while allowing the county to be home to great biodiversity, many species at risk, and a major migration route. Our natural heritage is integral to defining the high quality of place experience in the county. As such, it is a massive driver of our economy. Today, however, we wish to make a request that we believe is integral to protecting our natural heritage system for the long term. We request that council direct the 2021 draft official plan to be updated to give natural core area linkages the same protection as the natural core areas they connect. This request has been made to planning staff numerous times by our organizations and by other individuals and groups as well. The residents of Prince Edward County, represented by our organizations and others, agree that major development should not only not be permitted in natural core areas, but also not permitted in their linkages. What are natural core areas, linkages, natural core area linkages, and what do they do? A natural core linkage is a connection identified between natural core areas that helps to promote and sustain the ecological connectivity of the natural heritage system over the long term. Many of our linkages, for instance, connect our provincially significant inland wetlands with our coastal wetlands, which protect our shoreline from major storm surges, which are increasing with climate change. So I'm gonna try my cursor here. You can see one here from uh, Hubs Creek going into uh, Hikes Bay. There's a, that's a coastal wetland. This is an inland wetland. Actually, a lot of them connect inland wetlands to uh, coastal wetlands. Here's another big one. You see there's a coastal wetland right here. Here's the linkage, here's wetland stuff here. So you see that all of these are really important. They're interconnected for the health of each. Linkages are, inherent, are an inherent part of the natural heritage system. They support the natural processes necessary to maintain biological diversity, natural functions, viable populations of, indigen of indigenous species and ecosystems. That's the, those are the natural things that give us our natural infrastructure. Protecting linkages allows for protection for the free movement of fauna, as well as the protection of the vegetated landscape required by that fauna and for the maintenance of the integrity of the ecological system in general. Cutting off a core linkage that supports two natural core areas is akin to cutting off the blood supply to your foot and expecting it to be able to function on its own. Eventually, you will lose your foot. Why should major development be excluded from natural core area linkages? The official plan notes that tourist commercial development, industrial development, and other major developments have greater impacts on the natural environment. The adverse, major, the adverse impacts major development will have on natural core area linkages, if they are located in them, include loss of biodiversity, landscape fragmentation, and habitat degradation and loss. These are direct major impacts that will stop linkages from functioning as linkages. Major tourist destination venues like trailer parks, hotels, and resorts attract hundreds of visitors or more on a daily or weekly basis. Over many years, ongoing associated adverse impacts like constant noise, increased traffic, new access roads and trail systems, the creation of lawns, the presence of pets, light pollution, which particularly affects spawning grounds in seasonal wetlands, the increase of invasive species, as well as human activities like littering, poaching, and general overuse will stop a linkage from functioning as a linkage. Even one stopped linkage will weaken the entire natural heritage system. The provincial policy statement supports the precautionary principle, and this principle should be at the forefront of considerations regarding where major development should and should not be permitted. Opening our natural core area linkages to major development will potentially weaken or destroy the linkages that connect our natural heritage system. Because it is an interconnected system, 
the health of our natural heritage system depends just as much on the health of its linkages as it does on the health of its core areas. Without their linkages, the features that make up our natural core areas will lose their connectivity, their lifeblood. Eventually, they will deteriorate and the county will become a much less desirable and livable place. In summary, we respectfully request that council direct planning staff to update the draft official plan to give natural core area linkages the same protection as natural core areas. Giving them the same protection will be a major step forward in directing major commercial and industrial development to more suitable locations in the county. Thank you. Council. Thanks very much, Amy. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Is that okay? Stop yep, sharing. That would be terrific, thank you. Okay. That way I can see any hands that go up. Um, thank you very much, Amy. And, and thanks for your uh, deputation. I'll ask members of council if they have any questions. Anybody? Seeing none. Uh, thank you very much, Amy. Okay, thank you very much. I'll leave and uh, I'll try to join by YouTube. <laughs> okay, thanks right. very much. Okay. Uh, if we could have a mover and a seconder to receive Amy's deputation, please. Councillor Harper, seconded by Councillor Bailey. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Harper, Bailey motion. <clears throat> Deputation by Amy Bogan regarding adoption of official plan be received. Thank you. All those in favor? That carries. Chad, do we have Rosalind with us? She is in the waiting room. Okay. You want to let her in? Yep, she's in. Sorry, she's in the room. Okay. Rosalind, can you, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yep, yeah. can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, just uh, if you've got YouTube on, if you could turn it off uh, just to avoid feedback. And a reminder, you've got 10 minutes and there may be that may be followed by questions from members of council. So the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you. Mayor and councillors, in our current crises, approving an unsustainable official plan is dangerous. It really behooves you tonight to look at the question is the county official plan sustainable? The plan says it's sustainable 40 times. Unfortunately, it's not clear on what the term means. To define the term, a community's economy or its official plan is sustainable if it can take care of the needs of its people indefinitely into the future without undermining the basis of human existence. Let's break this down. The first part of sustainability is the county's ability to meet its needs. This doesn't exist. To give two examples, we cannot feed ourselves. We grow lots of food, but not on the basis of our own soil fertility. This we must import from outside the county in the form of thousands of tons of industrially produced chemical fertilizers. Our fruits and vegetables are reliant on a further import from thousands of kilometers away, and that's human labor. Out of a population of around 25,000, the county cannot even muster enough of a workforce to get its own food from field to table. The much larger problem with our food system is that almost all the food consumed in the county does not even originate locally, but is trucked in from hundreds to thousands of kilometers away. At the other end of our consumption, we can't deal with our own garbage. Virtually all of it gets trucked out of the county at huge fossil fuel expense. The most idiotic thing we do along these lines is the separate collection of compostable garbage, which can regenerate soil fertility. Instead of building soil here, our compost is trucked 250 kilometers away, and we call this green. We do not produce the materials we need for shelter or clothing. We do not produce any of the manufactured items we need. We have virtually no way of heating our homes locally or doing anything else that requires energy. The official plan is to keep it that way, despite being at the end of the massive flows of fossil fuel needed to make this way of life viable. In spite of our lack of productivity, we in the county overconsume material resources at an astronomical rate. Thanks to the pioneering and ongoing work of scientists like William Reese and Mathis Wackernagel, it can be quantified. This can be done using the concept of the ecological footprint. Very briefly, planet Earth has a certain ecological capacity to produce all the things we humans need for life. 
including food, fibers, lumber, actual space for living, and so on. This capacity can be expressed in biologically productive hectares. There are about 12.2 billion on Earth today. There are also about 7.8 billion people. That translates to about 1.6 hectares of global productivity per person. The global productivity that people are consuming can also be measured, and this is called the ecological footprint. Today, the world average per person ecological footprint is 2.75 global hectares, or about 70% greater than what planet Earth can sustainably provide. How can we be consuming more than what the Earth can provide? It's called overshoot. An oversimplified look at overfishing clarifies what this means. Any given population of fish can produce a certain number more fish on an ongoing basis annually. Let's say a colony of 100 redfish can produce 200 more redfish for human consumption every year. If we only harvest 200 redfish in the peak season when there are 300 redfish swimming around, we can go on harvesting into eternity. That's sustainable. But what happens if we get greedy? Say we decide to harvest 220 redfish a year. That's possible, but it only leaves the colony with 80. The next year, the colony can only produce 160 more redfish. That gives 240 in total. Well, we can still harvest 220, but you can see where this is going. That would leave a base population of 20 behind. The next year, the colony can produce 40 more fish for a grand total of 60. Let's see you harvest 220 now. Let's imagine your community depends upon redfish for its food supply. That's a bit of hyperbole to explain what happens if you consume beyond the regenerative capacity of an ecosystem. You start consuming the regenerative capacity itself. This is what we are doing all across the ecological basis of our existence, and the consequences are adding up. Collapsing fish stocks, soil erosion and degradation, deforestation, GHG buildup, widespread toxification, etc. To quote William Rees, the world community is literally financing its current population and material growth by liquidating the biophysical resources and support functions upon which the future of the human enterprise depends. The longer we remain in overshoot, the more we compromise the ability of future generations to thrive, unquote. The unsustainable world average consumption doesn't begin to describe the county. Here, we consume the productivity of 8.17 global hectares per person, over five times what the Earth can provide. Given that the Earth is dying from human overshoot, the sustainability claims of the consumption increasing official plant are absurd and obscene. You may be wondering, if we are overshooting our ecosystem so much, why is it that almost everywhere we look here, we see the image of sustainability? Let me take you through it. You roll out of bed in the morning. Where was your mattress made? How about your sheets, your pajamas, the clothes you're about to put on? Down the stairs you go. Where did the lumber for those stairs come from? The carpet that's on them. How about a coffee? Where does coffee come from? What about the packaging it's in? The cup, the coffee maker, the microwave? Let's check the cell phone and the computer. Where did those originate? What about their batteries? What about the coal tan and all your electronic devices? Your car and the gas in it? We cannot see the consequences of our unsustainable consumption because they are not happening here. So we don't see the clear cut forest, the desertification of farmland, the sprawling smoke spewing factories. We don't see jungles being torn up from mines or the moonscape our oil extraction has made of the boreal forest. We offload the devastating ecological costs of our consumption onto distant people and ecosystems. This seems to be working out pretty well for us. Despite what we are doing to others, we haven't actually exceeded the ecological carrying capacity here. Can't we just go on like this? That is the county official plan in a nutshell, by the way. The answer is no, and not just for moral, but for material reasons. For one, given our current consumption levels and trends in Canada, we will exceed our own ecological carrying capacity in less than 30 years. For another, the places where we import all our stuff from have already exceeded theirs, some by multiple times. Adding in the impacts of climate change, 
they are at extreme risk of hitting the wall. How much do you imagine these countries will be exporting to us then? Does the official plan prepare the county for the collapse of global trade? When their essential supplies like food crash, do you imagine the people of these other nations will simply stay put? It's important to be realistic here, since 80% of the world's population live in countries which are in ecological overshoot. Think mass migration with ecological refugees eventually ending up in countries with available ecological capacity. Does the official plan prepare the county for mass in-migration? And don't forget, the aggregate levels of consumption of humanity are in excess of what the planet can sustain. If we don't act now to radically lower our consumption levels, no amount of migration is going to solve the problem. There simply isn't going to be enough. Does the official plan prepare the county for social conflict, for resource wars? There is a way to mitigate these nightmare consequences. It is for small organized groups of people like municipalities, one after the other, to do the right thing. For us, the right thing is to reduce our material consumption by about 80%. Difficult, but with competent planning, not impossible. There are countries with high education, life expectancy, and income levels with sustainable ecological footprints. Cuba is an example. Part of your job is to protect your community from grave threats like unsustainability. You have the right to act tonight according to your conscience. And for the buck passers who want to say there's no point, you can only do what the federal and provincial governments tell you to do, I'll mention a principle established at Nuremberg that is relevant to acting to increase consumption in an ecological crisis as the official plan does. The fact that a person acted pursuant to the order of their government does not relieve that person of responsibility if a moral choice was available. A moral choice is available to you tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rosalind. Hang on, we'll see if anybody has any questions. Anybody? <clears throat> any questions for Rosalind? No. Okay. Councillor McNaughton, you've got a question? No, I have a comment uh, for uh, Rosalind and I wanna thank her for bringing these thoughts to the table tonight. It plagues me quite a lot. And um, whenever I hear you speak, I have, to, I have to go away and think about it for a very long time. And I appreciate that. Um, I, and I hear what your point is regarding uh, um, using uh, of, about cleaving to a higher power to, to place blame. The one thing I don't know how, the one thing I don't know how to fit with in this case is, is the um, requirement to replace our existing official plan that we're bound to at the moment is quite critical because it is, it is, um, uh, it is terrible and very outdated. So I, I do see that we do have to do something fairly quickly to replace it. And that whatever we do is going to be a vast improvement. But, but I think that your points are, are right and something to think about and something to strategize for. And I just wanna thank you for bringing that forward. And I will go away and think about, think about it for a very long time and try to, to um, Think about it in terms of practical planning. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? Is that Councillor Margotson? Yes. Thank you, Your Worship. And thank you, Rosalind, for that um, deputation. It's the very thought provoking, and I and I appreciate your comments. I just wondered, in your review of the official plan, was there, although I, it's clear that you feel it's insufficient. Is, is there anything you felt that was a lot better in this official plan than what we're working with? And I'm thinking of our protection or designation of a large amount of agricultural lands to be preserved in the county um, as per the province's desire to protect our viability for agriculture in the, into the future. And also our increased um, 
designation of natural areas to protect those. I just wondered if you had any comments on any positive aspects of this official plan. Thank you. Um, I, I would say like the wildlife protection is inadequate that you're doing. I mean, maybe it's better than, than the past, but it's, uh, it's not adequate for the crisis that we're in. And um, I, I see a lot of prime ag being built on right now. And I uh, just got a thing in my mailbox about uh, another 60 acres being, uh, there's a housing development being planned for it. So um, I, I just don't see adequate protection for agricultural land. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else? No? Okay, thank you very much, Roslyn for your uh, thoughtfulness and for um, making the time to present tonight. If we could have a mover and a seconder to receive the deputation, Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor McNaughton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a Roberts McNaughton motion that the deputation by Roslyn Adams regarding adoption of official plan be received. Thank you, all those in favor. And that carries. Thank you, we'll now move to Paul DeMello, and I will take a chance in this pronunciation and say Mark Tao. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor. It's Paul DeMello. I believe you have Mr. Uh, Tao's name correct. I was going to say two, uh, but I didn't check that up myself beforehand. So either one of us is incorrect and I think either of us owes an apology to Mark and I will apologize on behalf of him now. Um, I thank the opportunity to, uh, to the mayor and to council members for the opportunity to present today. Um, hey, I just, believe- Hang on, just, just, just one second. I just want to um, make sure as I am with everybody that YouTube is off so we don't get feedback and a reminder that you've got 10 minutes. It is, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I did turn it off because I heard your earlier comments. So okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, I just wanted to ask if, if council had been provided with my letter from February 3rd um, with regards to our submissions with regards to this application. I see I see Councillor Hirsch nodding his head. So I'm assuming council's had that. And I believe yeah. that letter provides a pretty good summary of, of the presentation that I wanted to make today. But I wanted to highlight a couple of points I'm, I am counsel, uh, I'm a partner with the firm of Kagan Shastri in Toronto, and we are counsel for Michael Kerford and his company 712223NB Limited, um, owners of the lands that I've described uh, in, in the letter. Um, our client has been meeting with municipal staff for some time now since the acquisition of the lands, proposing an 18 lot subdivision uh, for the lands. Uh, when they acquired the lands, they acquired into the existing designations and permissions for it and were advised that a subdivision would be permitted and they proceeded on that basis. Um, our clients have been involved with the OP review uh, through themselves and through their planner, uh, Mr. Tu from, uh, from IBI, who's also available to answer any questions that is, should count. So we'll have any questions regarding the specifics of the application tonight. Um, one of the, uh, while, while our clients have some general concerns with the direction of the official plan update, um, I'll be, I want to be uh, very fair with council is that we're principally concerned with the site specific proposal and development. We think that you've gone a, we think that some of the directions that you've gone with your official plan are potentially problematic. But from the perspective of the client, of my, my client in this case, the concern is, as you would appreciate, with regards to the specific development proposal. And that's why the letter outlines what we've proposed as three methods in which to deal with the specific proposal. And I wanted to first highlight the concern, the principal concern is your official plan is, as part of the update is proposing a prohibition and I characterize it as a blanket prohibition on country lot subdivisions. And that's uh, in our view, 
the blanket prohibition against country lot subdivisions, we think in the long term is detrimental to many of the objectives that the county has in terms of growth and what makes the county attractive to not only existing residents, but to new residents. So in the letter, we've proposed three ways in terms of dealing with it. Our principal concern is the country lot subdivision blanket prohibition would prevent consideration of our client's application on their lands. So as you will see from the letter, we proposed three options. The first was to identify the permission for and to remove the blanket prohibition of country lot subdivisions, but to allow for them, provided that the application can demonstrate how they are consistent with the policies of how they have how they sorry how they are consistent with the policies of the plan and help and how the proposal would meet the objectives of the plan that provides for the recognition that the county still has a determination to make the determination that this meets the objectives that you're seeking to establish through your plan it doesn't provide for a prohibition but allows for the consideration which we think is a key component in any planning matter the second component that we've addressed, and we think is the most ideal one from the perspective of the county, because we can understand that there may be a concern with regards to widespread applications for country lot subdivisions in areas that the county may not think are appropriate. Um, and as such, what we've proposed is a site-specific provision that would address uh, our client's concern. And if I can, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to share the screen and put up that policy provision if I can. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> um, yes. I believe you should be, oh, there it goes. I believe council should be seeing the screen now with the site specific provision identified. Yep. Okay. This is taken directly from my letter February 3rd. So council will have hard copies of it or have their own copies of it. But what it does is it proposes a site specific policy to be inserted into the official plan that would allow for consideration of the application. And what it does is it defines the maximum of the application. And in this case, it would be a maximum of an 18 lot subdivision for the lands and further sets out that the application shall have to demonstrate that the subdivision shall be designed and it is set out a bunch of different criteria, including environmental protections. And if I go down further, for example, where any portion of proposed development on lands is within a natural core area or within or adjacent to woodlands, wetlands, or other, uh, other provincially significant, non-provincially significant, as identified Schedule B, Development it may only be permitted provided that in a, it is supported by an environmental impact study completed to the satisfaction of the municipality. The way we've drafted this site specific provision is it does not in any way prejudge an application that may come in uh, for the subject lands. It provides as a framework and it allows for the continuation of the process that was already commenced by my client shortly after the acquisition of the lands and allows for the continuation of that pre-consultation, the submission of the applications and provides the framework for limiting it. The advantages of the site-specific policy is that it provides a great deal of certainty for the county, provides certainty for my client as well, of course, but it provides certainty in terms of it's this parcel of land, it's this potential consideration for this parcel land, but it doesn't in any way prejudge what the planning merits of any application that may come forward would, would, uh, would, would, uh, would identify. We think for a number of reasons as I've identified that this provides for the greatest security and the greatest certainty with regards to the applications. Should, however, uh, council determine that it doesn't want to identify a site-specific provision. What we've identified would be as the third alternative would be a general transition provision. And I would note that this is consistent with what's in the latest update that staff has provided. They have provided for some language on a general site-specific provision. But I, one of the concerns that we have is that in our view, the general transition provision is potentially too open-ended from the county's perspective, and it doesn't provide the certainty for applicants and um, uh, proposed applications such as that of my client that are currently 
in the hopper or in the line as I would like to describe them. So if I could share again, I'd like to identify the proposed language. And what we've done is we've slightly modified the language from what was contained in my letter so that we think it provides some greater uh, certainty for council. And if I may share that, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. So council will now see our proposed transition. I believe you should have that in front of you. Yep. And what we've done is we've identified that where an owner of land has either submitted a Planning Act application prior to the plan coming into full force and effect, which would be after ministerial approval and all appeals have been resolved, or has demonstrated that they have engaged in a pre-consultation with municipal staff prior to the date upon which the plan has been adopted by council. So that provides council with the certainty that the day you adopt this application, you're not providing for the ability for some to come in for transition after the adoption. It provides you with that certainty of that confirmation. At least they have come in, done the pre-consultation application with municipal staff, I have identified the studies required to be submitted. Um, and then we say any such application may be filed in support of the development with the required supporting studies shall be considered and determined in accordance with the policies of the plan in effect as the date of the pre-consultation provided that the application is submitted with the required studies by December 31st, 2021. So what we've also done is we've put an end date to this transition. So you don't have someone coming in and said, I spoke with municipal staff potentially in January of this year, but they wait two years or wait a lengthy period of time in which to file. We, we don't think that would be fair to the municipality either. So we're providing for this certainty. And council may be aware of a concept that's called the clergy principle. And the clergy principle is a, is a principle that's been identified by the local planning appeal tribunal. It says an application is to be determined on the basis of the policies that were in force and effect as of the date that the application is made. This transition provision enforces and highlights that clergy principle. It's consistent with that clergy principle. It would allow for my client and others to come in under the, under the concept of the clergy principle to have those applications that they've already undertaken with the municipality, whether through a formal application or whether through a pre-consultation um, to address and to be considered under the policies in effect at the time. Um, if I could. Paul, Paul just, uh, you're just about out of time here, so. Certainly. I just wanted to address, um, and I know, I know council has seen the, the, the recommendations from staff with regards to the transition. And the concerns that we have is that it provides for the, the submission of an application, even though not complete, as long as one study is missing because of seasonality. We're trying to address that by the December 31st date. And the problem with the one study application is that there are other studies that may be required that have been caught by seasonality. In this case, there would be an archeological study and potentially a hydrogeological study has to be done that would require some seasonality time to it. The other concern that we have with the transition is that it doesn't provide the clarity and the certainty that we hope that our general transition would provide in terms of making sure that the only applications that fit under the transition are those that are before council um, or sorry, before staff have been part of the pre consultation with staff as part of this OP review. I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, Mr. Mayor or any members of council will have. We've been very supportive of the OP process and look forward to continuing to work with staff and council on that. Okay, thanks, thanks very much, Paul. The subject of uh, transition has been um, uh, certainly discussed uh, at, at length certainly today and leading up to uh, this evening's meeting. So um, I think it's fair to say we, we understand. I will ask members of council if they have any questions or comments for Paul. Anybody? Councilor Margotson. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. And thank you, um, Mr. DeMello for out outlining your concerns regarding your, your planning proposal. 
did I hear you say how many years you've been working on this? Or a, in terms of number of years, Mr. Chair, uh, through you, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to the Councillor, I apologize. I don't have that specific information. I think it was the acquisition of the lands, and I, I unfortunately I didn't pull up. I think it's been a number of years, and our client has been in with pre-consultation. Um, I would say at least a year plus, perhaps Mr. Tu from IVI can either send me a message or confirm the details with regard to that. I just can't find it offhand. Um, the issue in terms of getting the, the final details and study is the seasonality required. And before you undertake those types of EIS studies, there's also always a pre-consultation with not only staff, but the conservation authorities to determine the scopes of those studies. So it's very often they're timely studies that take time to bring forward. It also takes time to prepare what would be a plan and work out what are the other arrangements associated with a plan. Thank you. So just to follow up, so you've been working on it at least a year. Yeah. And you didn't understand the, the studies that were required until just recently. Is that correct or? Uh, no, I wouldn't classify it as we didn't understand the studies. That's not the case. Uh, okay. Sorry, council. 18 months, sorry. Uh, we've been working on this 18 months since the ownership, 20 months the pre-application. So it's been about a year. It's not a matter of simply not understanding study, but it's a matter of it takes some time in order to prepare a draft plan to consider the access requirements, everything required. These studies aren't something that you submit on a quick basis. Um, I've had applications for other development proposals that before you even get to the application stage, there's a couple of years in terms of doing studies and coming up with concept plans that go forward. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Okay, anybody else? Any questions? Council Roberts. Thank you for your deputation. Um, appreciated it. You use the date December 31st, 2021 as your, it's called a cutoff date. Um, how did you decide on that date, please? Through me. And, and to reiterate that there has been quite a lot of uh, thought gone into transition matters, uh, which yeah. will no doubt come up later this evening, but I just like to understand the date that you reference. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Through you, Mr. Oh. Mayor, to the Councillor. Yeah. The December 31st, 21, uh, 2021 date, we identified because um, we figured that if Council were to approve the applications, uh, uh, sorry, approve the official plan either tonight or sometime shortly thereafter, those applications or those development proposals that are in the hopper, as I like to describe them, or have been considered, December 31st, 2021, we believe provides the opportunity for the seasonality required of the EIS because you've got to do your spring, your summer, your fall. Not necessarily, there's, there's, either, there's usually generally the three season approach that you've got to do. Uh, sometimes that can be scoped depending on the basis of the information we have. And we envision specifically in particular with my client's case, because some of that work's already been undertaken and, st and started that December 31st of this year provides people with the opportunity to do that seasonality approach and study required. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Paul, for uh, attending and you as well, Mark. Um, much appreciated you taking the time to uh, come forward. You could I have a mover and a seconder to receive the deputation, please? Councillor. McMahon, seconded by Councilor Margitson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, McMahon, Margitson, motion that the deputation of Paul DeMello regarding adoption of the official plan be received. Thank you. All those in favor? And that carries. Thank, Thank you, you again. Much. Thank you very much. Okay, Chad, have we got um, Adam Layton and Murray Evans? Uh, Mr. Mayor, yes, they are in the room. Okay. Oh, they're there. Okay. Welcome, gentlemen. Just thank a, you, Mark. Just thank if, you, I Mark. Could, just, if, if I could um, ask if you've got YouTube on to turn it off so we don't get interference and you have 10 minutes for your deputation and the floor is yours whenever you'd like to begin.
Thank you, Worship, members of council. We have turned off to YouTube, so hopefully there won't be any reverberation. Uh, my name is Murray Evans. Beside me is Mr. Adam Layton. We're planning consultants for the Black Note Canada, Inc. Uh, company that has, I'm sure council may be aware, that has a pending application before the municipality to create its winery and processing and restaurants, retail, and hopefully the complimentary uh, accommodation in the form of a hotel and spa. Uh, our original concern was with the clarity of the transition policy. So we may as well follow up Mr. DeMello. Uh, however, I, I think I can say to you and cut my uh, intrusion into your council meeting very short is that we've had several discussions with uh, Mr. Michaud and uh, uh, we've explained our concerns about it as we do have a pending application and a fair amount of time and effort has gone in. And it's uh, Adam's and my job now to get that moving forward in a positive manner. And so we'd like to continue the regime that it was originally submitted under. And Mr. Michaud's uh, proposed revisions certainly uh, more than adequately take care of our concerns and provide the clarity we're looking for. So I'm simply here before you tonight to say we would ask that you adopt the transition policy as uh, recently revised. And if you have any questions regarding our project, we'll be pleased to answer them. And hopefully we'll be seeing a lot of each other over the next uh, six or eight months while we refine our applications. And I'll leave it at that, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll ask, does anybody have any uh... Any questions for Mr. Layton or Mr. Evans? No, nope, don't see any. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming. Uh, could I have a mover and a seconder to receive the deputation, please? Councillor Prinzen, seconded by Councillor Harper. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a Prinzen Harper motion that the deputation by Adam Layton and Murray Evans regarding adoption of official plan be received. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? And that carries. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. And we'll go to the final deputation, which is Bob Clark, who is, uh, there he is. Okay, Bob, if I could just remind you, as I have everyone turn off YouTube, if you've got it on, yeah, and no, if you have uh, 10 minutes, to uh, make your deputation and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I've been uh, busy doing other things at this point. So you'll give me a minute here just to, uh, we have uh, put together uh, our, our um, letter and a uh, report which was originally submitted to uh, the uh, public consultation process uh, for their review. Um, the property that uh, we're particularly interested in is the Arthur Road property owned by um, Mr. Bob Hunter. And uh, this is an unusual situation in which the capability classification shown on the soil capability mapping is 2R. And uh, they're um, based on our experience and other properties in Prince Edward County. Uh, there are several other properties that we have uh, addressed which have this pe peculiar capability rating. The uh, capability rating R, or the subclassification R, uh, is a shallow rock classification, but it doesn't start until class three. And at class three, the capability or the depth of uh, the rock is three feet. Um, what, what happens here is, uh, as you can see, if you review our capability mapping, we conducted a, a detailed capability mapping with the tire and property. And the soils here are very shallow. They would, according to our uh, capability mapping, uh, you, um, uh, have a capability of class four or class five. Um, the difficulty here is that because of the capability rating, I believe that the Lear scoring was unusually high. And um, 
there was one other reason for that, and that is that uh, at the time of the scoring, uh, the land had recently been purchased and uh, the owner of the land had attempted to cultivate it. Uh, that resulted in dragging up uh, rock fragments and uh, the crop itself was a failure. Um, I believe that um, these lands, although they may have some capability for specialty crop, as far as general farming is concerned, uh, they are uh, a very low capability rating. And because of that, I think both this property and the property around it has been classified and scored exceptionally high. It's our position that the scoring and the capability rating um, should be ex much lower. And for that reason, we question the, um, the change in the designation of these lands from rural to prime agricultural. Um, the, in our opinion, these lands are not prime agricultural under the meaning of the provincial policy statement. And uh, therefore, uh, they don't qualify, in our opinion, they don't qualify for that capability rating. Uh, I'd be pleased to answer any questions if, uh, if any of the council have questions, but that essentially is our position. And as I say, uh, we have conducted and provided our, our uh, mapping and report uh, to uh, the review team. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. Any questions of members of council concerning this uh, deputation? Councillor Hirsch. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Mayor, and Thank you, Bob. Um, I just found this a bit curious. In your, in your letter, it noted that the lands were really not capable of cultivation, and you just reinforced that in your statement this evening. Um, but when I look at your, the second piece of information you submitted with the, um, what are they called? Um, test pit logs and so on. All of the locations are described as cornfield. So I decided to go for a drive on Google Earth and drove, drove down Arthur Road, where you can see uh, in the summertime, which we can't do today, obviously. And those fields looked like they were bearing a pretty decent looking crop of, of winter wheat. So I really wonder about the accuracy of, of claiming that this is not you know, these, these fields are not capable of, of cultivation. So I'm, I'm not inclined based on that evidence to, um, to accept that position. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Any questions? Councilor Margitson. Thank you. Just to recap, Bob, it's Ernie Margitson here. Um, you're suggesting that it would be more appropriately designated rural than agricultural. Is that my understanding? That's correct. And that, that was it. And, the, and there's the farm, there's been two severances off this land, this parcel already? Um, I, I don't you're not know aware. that. I'm not aware of that, uh, the history of that. Okay, thank you, Bob. Okay. Any other uh, questions from members of council or comments? from anyone not at this point. Well, if I could have, okay. if I could have just a, a second or a, a brief comment. A, a very brief comment, it's not. Yes, I, th I think uh, I, I understand that uh, this, there may have been a crop growing on the property, but I, I would, uh, in my experience, uh, we've done a number of capability ratings, and uh, I believe that this capability is accurate. Okay, thank you. All right, seeing no more questions, I think, Bob, this is a matter that, that you can talk to our planning staff about if you want to uh, proceed more about it. But thank you for bringing the information to, uh, to our attention this evening. I have you. a mover and a seconder to... Uh, Councillor Margitson, seconded by Councillor Forrester. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a Margitson Forrester motion that the deputation by Bob Clark regarding the adoption of official plan be received. 
Thank you. All those in favor? That carries. Thank you. So we'll move to item number seven, comments from the audience. And we have one in Cheryl Anderson. Welcome, Cheryl. If you have you. You, if, if you have YouTube on, could you please turn it off? And a reminder, you've got three minutes. Thank you. I did turn the YouTube off. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Good. Loud Good evening. Clear. My name is Cheryl Anderson, and I'm representing APEC, PECFEN, PETBO, and SSJI. Humans need a healthy, diverse biosphere to function and grow. Many natural features allow that to happen, including wetlands. Our official plan, as a vital document, will define how we handle the next years of unprecedented development. Prince Edward County has demonstrated environmental responsibility by declaring itself an unwilling host for industrial wind turbines and acknowledging the climate emergency. My goal now, to convince you to enhance the protection for wetlands in the draft OP. Land use and development directly affects wetlands. The draft OP identifies provincially significant wetlands and other wetlands. For provincially significant wetlands, it disallows development within 120 meters and within 50 meters of coastal wetlands. For other county wetlands, development is allowed up to 30 meters. Whenever the goal is to conserve biodiversity and natural features such as wetlands, municipalities are free to define their own buffers as long as they meet those minimum requirements. MNRF's Natural Heritage Reference Manual even encourages them to do so. Think about these distances in the context of a football field. There is a good chance for a touchdown from the 30-yard line. Kickoffs happen at the 50-yard line. The total distance of the field and end zone is about 120 meters. 30 meters is really not a very large distance and insufficient to protect county wetlands when development is proposed adjacent to them, or even to protect development when wetlands swell and overflow in the summer storm. Our county is unique in geology and geography. Though surrounded by water, we are challenged by our extremely dry summers and unreliable groundwater sources. Data show our country gets the least amount of rainfall of any Ontario county from May to August. We need to protect our wetlands because they recharge our groundwater supply, clean water that flows through them and mitigate floods. These county wetlands also supply water sources for agriculture and important natural habitat for birds and animals. The size and shape of wetlands change over time. A small pocket of water in reeds today can become a torrent after a raging summer storm. Tonight, by ensuring a 50 meter buffer around all county wetlands, you have the opportunity to show once again that Prince Edward County has achieved a sensitive and sensible balance between living within the natural environment and allowing reasonable and responsible development. You will ensure that not only our wetlands are protected, but our developments as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, see if anybody's got any questions, anyone? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Very much Thank appreciate you. you taking the time to uh, make your presentation this evening. Can I have a mover and a seconder to um, receive the comment from the audience, please? Councillor Forrester, seconded by Councillor McNaughton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Forrester McNaughton, motion to uh, comment by Cheryl Anderson be received. Okay. Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. Now we'll move on to uh, items for consideration and item 8.1. Um, before we um, move forward, just a couple of comments. This is a, a an extremely complex and important document uh, that's been in the works for years, as I think everybody knows. And I'm sure everybody has questions and comments. And there, there have certainly been many that have been um, put forward online. So here's what, uh, here's how I would like to uh, proceed as we consider this, this, the uh, the draft OP. 
Um, we'll put the item on the floor and we'll start with the, uh, allow Michael to update on the slide deck that has been provided. I think that was part of your plan, Michael. Um, get that update. Um, we can ask Michael about questions of the slide deck. And then I'd like to deal pretty methodically through the, uh, through the plan itself, um, going primary section by primary section. That, so that's section 2.0 onto 2, 3.0. Any questions, any comments about those sections, and then we'll uh, we'll move from one to the other, as opposed to jumping all over the uh, the plan. Th this will allow Michael to, you know, and and other staff members to answer questions in a pretty orderly uh, orderly fashion. Um, so I, I'm hoping that approach is okay with everybody, and we can start by putting the uh, item on the floor. We have a mover and a seconder for that. Councillor Bailey, seconded by Councillor Roberts. This is a Bailey Roberts motion that Council received report DS 18 2021 for information and two, that Council direct staff to prepare both a cultural heritage master plan and a review of the shoreland designation in advance of 2023 for consideration in a subsequent official plan amendment and three, that council approve the official plan 2021 as shown in attachment one and provide to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing for final approval. Okay, thank you. So Michael, you have uh, prepared the, the slide deck today. It was distributed. So do you have comments and I will hand it to you to walk through that, which I presume is your intent. Yes, it is, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, before I get going through the slide deck, I just want to deal with one particular item in regards to my report. Um, about halfway through the report in the agricultural uh, Lear section, about halfway through that particular section, I made some erroneous comments uh, uh, at that point in time, indicating that uh, the environmental committee was at odds with uh, the agricultural community in regards to the hedgerows and fence bottoms policies. And, and indeed I, I was wrong in that. It was the natural heritage conservation uh, group that made those comments, not the environmental committee that made those comments. And then subsequent to that on the, on the next line, it's not the environmental committee uh, it's environmental comments uh, and the ACC are also it adds in, in regards to agricultural drains and fish habitat. So I had a number of comments from a lot of different environmental groups and uh, I apologize for the confusion. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Okay. Um, moving on to the slide deck. Um, uh, Chatted, I guess it didn't check with you, but are you uh, are you doing the um, sharing the screen? Yeah, sharing the screen, or do you want me to? Uh, through the mayor, uh, you can use your screen. You can share your screen. Okay, I just have to find it now. Everybody see the uh, yep. PowerPoint? Okay, perfect. So we'll move on to um, slide two. So I guess after the, the last public meeting, we did get a number of comments. A lot of the comments are, are up on the screen now in terms of written in comments, but also got a lot of comments from um, property owners that called in was asking questions or, or, or making comments in, in respect to one policy or another. And I was able to have the, a good discourse with them at that point in time to either um, 
answer their questions or at least give them a little bit more information so that uh, they were um, more well informed in regards to how a policy would would deal with certain things. So uh, that's simply uh, again a slide just to give you an idea of some of the comments commenters that uh, provided some some issues to us. The, the next slide is uh, the infamous transition policy that um, was talked about earlier in some of the deputations and, and uh, was discussed uh, by a number of uh, individuals over the, the last little while. So there was a lot of concern in regards to the initial draft in terms of its clarity. Um, so we went back to the drawing board um, in terms of some of the comments from Mr. Tao and from Mr. Layton um, and came up with this particular uh, rendition, uh, which basically says that application submitted and deemed complete in advance of the Ministry, Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing approval of the 2021 Council adopted official plan on or before July 2021, whichever is first. So if, if you get an application in with us, we can deem it complete uh, before July 6th or um, or before the uh, ministry approves the document, then we would review it under the old official plan from 2006. Um, in, the, in terms of Mr. Kerford's applica application that uh, Mr. DeMello was uh, referring to, um, he's well along the way. Uh, he, he has a deemed complete, uh, sorry, um, the only application or, or sorry, report that he's missing is the EIS and so knowing that these EISs and sometimes a hydrology study do take uh, longer than, than, than a year based on, on some seasonality issues associated with whenever you submit the application and to the time that you can complete all the work and then deal with the uh, ramifications of those studies. Um, we did add in this last uh, section dealing with seasonality and reports. So effectively, if you can, show the planning department that you've done all the other work, you have your transportation study, your plan, uh, a noise study or anything else that's required as, as per a, a pre-consultation that's already taken place, um, then, then we'll deal with the application along the, the lines of the 2006 official plan. So that's why we, we changed it to just add some more clarity. The next uh, slide deals with some environmental policy changes. Where do we ask questions? Oh, well, wait till wait till he's finished with the, the the slide deck, and then we'll go back to questions. Okay, thank you. Carry on, Michael. Um, in terms of environmental policy, um, in section four point five point four point three, um, there was a developer who had uh, some issues in terms of. They're proposing a plan of subdivision with the settlement area that's also impacted by a natural core area. So we just wanted to add a sentence to that particular policy, again, to provide some clarity in that uh, uh, the residential development subdivision site plans of condominiums are permitted within a natural core area that's also within a settlement area subject to an approved environmental impact study. And this goes in, in format and, and along with the, the official plan and the idea of um, providing growth or generalizing growth and moving growth into our settlement areas throughout the community. One other environmental change that was made is to 5.3, which is the definition for major development. Uh, there's a lot of discussion with, um, with a number of environmental groups in terms of uh, how this definition should be be worded and, and framed and framed um, at the public meeting we, we had some wording that was provided by um, by uh, one of the speakers um, and um, that wording was put into place uh, but a, upon a, another I guess a third look at it uh, we ended up uh, wanting to change the word and and putting in or uh, in in that particular, definition. So it, it's reflective of if you had a development that was under 500 square meters in imperviousness, but it was impacting greater than one, one acre uh, site or 0.4 hectares, 
then that would be considered a major development. So it was just a way of, of clarifying everything um, in terms of what the environmental groups uh, were looking for versus what, um, what the policy is really trying to do. So uh, we're looking to protect the natural core areas. So this is a, a way of doing that. The remainder of the changes are all sort of technical in nature for the most part in terms of swapping out a couple of words that uh, were, were not needed or um, were duplications or adding in a couple of words for clarification. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Mayor, if you want me to go through each one of them. Uh, they're fairly, fairly minor in nature. Um, maybe I'll take some direction from yourself. I, I, I think if anybody has questions about all these all these points, they can come up when we open the floor to questions. I don't okay. think you need to go through all of them. Okay, perfect. So that then brings us to, to a few mapping changes. And it's not necessarily to the schedules, it's actually to the maps that are associated and give you a better definition of each settlement area. So in terms of the Hillier map, um, adding in that area that's uh, marked in yellow, um, for some reason, the map was not changed way back when things when the county was amalgamated or the, the municipality was amalgamated into one large county. So uh, we're just adding that in. So it's reflective of the actual schedule. Um, Black River, um, we're adding in a parcel. There was a correction in the GIS system. So that parcel is now part of uh, Black River settlement area. Cherry Valley with some better parcel mapping that we received from MPAC we can better define those areas in yellow uh, in terms of what's in and what's out outside of the settlement area. And then the last map or last uh, slide would be a change to the resolution based on some of the changes that uh, we're proposing tonight uh, as staff um, that, we, that we need a, a new phrase within the, uh, within the resolution to capture uh, the changes that are I've already I've proposed or the staff's proposed, or may come come forward through uh, discussion tonight. Okay, and that's the end of the presentation. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Michael, for that uh, for that update. If you could get back to the uh, remove the screen sharing, I'll open the floor to questions. Okay, there we go. Um, so we'll open floor to questions about the slide deck, what Michael just spoke about. Councillor Roberts, I think you were um, keen there, so go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's been a lot of work. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Michael, you, you use in the matter of transition, uh, and speaking to that, you used the date of July 6, 2021, and we heard a deputation this evening referencing December 31st, 2021. What are the relative merits of July 6th versus December 31st, please? Especially since seasonality was mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, the, um, with the July 6th date, um, I, I tried to try, uh, choose a date that would be more in line with the timing of the ministry giving uh, approval to the document. Um, I guess typically you're looking at a, a four to six month process for uh, them to review and, and ultimately approve the document. Um, the original uh, draft of the OP did go to the ministry for review. So they've, they've had an opportunity to review a lot of the document already, although there's been a number of changes since I've come on board at the, at the county. But nonetheless, they've had a review, so I don't anticipate uh, them spending eight months or nine months uh, going through the document. Um, so with the July 6th date, it was trying to, to find a time frame that would be fairly close to uh, the approval. Whereas if you waited you know, right to the end of the year, um, then you get applications that are sort of uh, incongruent with the, the approval date. Um, you know, if you're, you're going out six, eight months from an, uh, the actual approval, I guess, are you really 
accepting that application in terms of what the new official plan is trying to do. I guess that's the, the difference between those two dates. Okay. Okay. I've Thank got, you, I've got Councillor Nyman. Just hold your hands up. Councillor Nyman, then Councillor Hirsch, Bailey. Oh, that's a good start. Okay, Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Michael. I, I just want to go to the transition policy. And I, I just, I guess, to clarify. So if you go put the date to July 6th, somebody brings a uh, application in, um, <clears throat> We have in the past asked for, and I don't think it's we have it yet, but a checklist. Uh, if I'm bringing an application into you for um, something, um, I, I receive from the planning department, this is what I need to do. And then when you got that done, bring it back. Because I think we've all heard that I bring my application in, you have to do this, you come back, and then, no, you're not completed yet, you gotta do more. Do we have that checklist that we don't run into that problem? That somebody brings it in, they don't get turned back to go do more, they know up front what they have to do so that they don't miss that date of July 6th. <clears throat> We don't necessarily have a checklist. What we have is the pre-consultation process. So as part of that process, a letter goes out to the applicant saying, um, you need to fulfill these particular studies and make these particular changes to either plan or, or, or uh, your application. Once those changes are made and, and those studies come in, they're reviewed to determine whether or not uh, they're acceptable. And if they're acceptable, then, then the application is deemed complete. Quick follow up. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Michael. So, um, and what's the turnaround time on that? I guess um, to, to get that to, to the applicant. It really function of the nature of the changes. Um, you know, from pre consultation to an actual application, you're you're probably looking at a couple of months if the the changes are are fairly minimal or if they've already done some work uh, associated with the traffic study or a noise study or whatever types of studies that are required. Um, once we get it, um, we need about a week's time to sort of read that, that documentation, make sure that the information is there. You know, they, they, could, they could do uh, what's called an FSR, a functional service stream report, and it doesn't address stormwater. So they really haven't completed that particular study. So then they would be asked to go away and, and, and do that investigation uh, before we deem it complete. Okay. Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I'd like to start out this evening actually by thanking staff, especially Mike Michaud and our CAO for pushing through this incredible piece of work in a reasonably short period of time. We've been uh, in the county needing a new official plan for a long time. And it kind of meandered around until this tremendous effort was made uh, really starting last summer. So congratulations on a great job. In respect of the, of the slide deck, uh, Mr. Mayor, you asked about that. First of all, um, I support uh, all of the items um, covered in the slide deck. I think the July timeframe for grandfathering is acceptable. In my view, I would say that anybody who has been serious about undertaking a development would have been and should have been aware of um, this process for quite some time and the direction that we're going and, um, and you know, should have been well along the way. And, and many of them are, as we know, there are many folks who are at the point um, of, of maybe almost having complete applications. We heard from Mr. Uh, Mr. Evans, for instance, that he says he's all happy with July. That's fine. They, they can get the work done by then for a rather major, major, you know, proposal. So, 
I, I think if we went longer than that, we'd be inviting new people to come out of the woodwork for things to try to get around some of the, the policies that we, we really do want to um, put in place as quickly as we can. Um, in terms of specifics, uh, following your plan, Mr. Mayor, of doing a chapter by chapter, I do have um, things to talk about for chapter three and chapter four and, um, and a little proposal for uh, amending the motion uh, at the end. So I'll leave it until we get to those chapters to uh, to carry out the remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Your Worship, Michael. Uh, from your slide deck, I'm on Environmental Policy four point five point four three. Residential development, subdivision, site plans, condominiums is permitted within a natural core area that is within a settlement area. How clearly have we defined the natural core areas? Um, the natural core areas, the actual line themselves, is, is fairly nebulous. It's, it's done at a high level. Um, so that's why you would look at an EIS, is to give you further direction as to where that line might fall, whether it's in the middle of a property or maybe it's on the edge of the property or perhaps it's not even on the property. So we, we, re we would really rely on the environmental study to determine exactly where that line is. But just to make sure that um, you know, we, we do get the growth where we want the growth in our settlement areas, uh, we just felt that this, pol this sentence within this policy would provide a little bit more clarity as to how to interpret uh, development within settlement areas. My concern, of course, is that those natural core areas don't shrink too much. Okay, anybody else? Show of hands. Uh, just one sec, just put your hand up so I can write down here. Councillor Forrester, then Councillor Margotson. Anybody else? Okay, Councillor Forrester. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so, well, thank you very much. It's been very interesting. Uh, and I can, must say, reading through this over and over again, it's, I must say, I found it very difficult to fully understand what this means for us in the future. I can sort of get the gist. I've sat around here for a long time and on how this will play out, but I, I guess really understanding how this will move from development to development and what will be brought to us and how we interpret that. Uh, I guess I'm just gonna have to see how it plays out in time. But I guess one of my big questions is here, uh, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, this honor period where up until 2021, anything in the system can move ahead. I'm assuming some of the plans that we have in place, right, could go to a, a tribunal. Now, if that did happen and they knew that council really was looking to change something, yeah. but just because of the grace period didn't happen, how would that be seen in a tribunal? You know? Do you understand what I'm saying here? Like, this is what concerns yeah, me. Yeah. Uh, because we might say, you know what? We really don't like this and we're going to change it in the future. But we're giving somebody up until the end of this year or to this summer to get it in. But we sure won't allow this in the future. Like, aren't we sort of setting ourselves up for a big argument against our case? No, I don't believe so. If, if there's an application that uh, comes in and it's, and it's being reviewed by under the 2006 official plan and it does get a, appealed, um, the policy that's in play at that point in time is the 2006 official plan. So when we're at LPAT, that is the guiding document that uh, would be discussed. And then whatever, you know, who knows what's going to happen in LPAT, uh, you know, the, the you could go in thinking one thing and then policies are, are, are changed or added to, to come up with a settlement. Um, so if the new official plan gets, gets approved during that time frame of LPAT, then you'd have to be cognizant of the, the, the new plan being in place and you'd have to create an official plan amendment under the new official plan where you'd have notwithstanding clauses. So notwithstanding this particular policy, due to the LPAT, 
this set of policies are, is in play for this particular piece of property. So, it, oh. so it, it, it gives you an exclusion to the, to the new official plan. Okay, Councilor Margitson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, thanks a lot, Michael. I know you've been working hard at this and it's good job, well done. Um, I just wanted to comment, as you know, I've been reviewing the transition policy with, with the CAO and, and other, other councillors. And when it gets to the time, I'd like to propose a slight amendment that I feel is better and provides more certainty to as, as far as the date. And that would be to propose at the time that we just um, accept applications, uh, whether they're in process or between now and that date. And if they can be deemed complete before July 6, 2021, they'll be reviewed under the current official plan. And that takes away the uncertainty of not knowing when the ministerial approval will happen. They've had it since October. Some people are telling me it could happen fairly soon. Um, it could happen later for sure, but everyone will work by that date. And it gives our staff and those proponents and people that have been working on this, so it gives them this the time that they know they have to get things going. And we still have the provision in there, the seasonality provision. So if there are studies that can't be completed, such as EIS or hydrogeology, because they want to wait till the summer when, when water tables lower or whatever. So that's what I'm gonna propose at the time. And I feel I have a seconder. Um, I can get one, looks like Councillor Roberts. So that will be an amendment that I'll be proposing. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. See none. Let's go on to the plan itself. And um, as I say, go through this methodically. I'm sure that because of the amount of time that everybody has had various iterations, um, everybody's got questions or comments prepared. Um, so we, with that in mind, we'll uh, start with, might as well start with the introductory and then just go from there. Any questions about this particular section? Councillor McNaughton. So this is a general question that I think this would be the right section for, I guess. Uh, but it relates to the process of approval uh, under the ministry. So uh, if the ministry does, does, if this plan receives approval or whatever plan we send from the ministry, subsequent, if there are subsequent changes that are somewhat more significant, for example, if there is a re, um, a re uh, consideration of our shoreline policies altogether, do they receive the same amount of um, ministry scrutiny or do they, um, or are they simply within municipal hands at that point? Mike? Uh, okay, um, through you, Mr. Mayor. I, I gather you're speaking of if, um, if the plan's approved by the ministry and we do these, these changes to the shoreland policies. Um, or any other similar yeah. sort of significant. Then, then it, it doesn't go back to the ministry. We've been delegated that that right to make uh, changes to our official plan. It's only going to the ministry because uh, that's the Planning Act requirement that this newer document gets approved by the minister. When the, when the minister reviews it, they review it uh, as per the ministries at, uh, at the provincial level in terms of the provincial policy statement and other um, provincial policies from other different uh, ministries to, to ensure yeah. that uh, you know there, there's a, a complete provincial review of the document because um, we have to be in conformity with the provincial legislations, uh, but we cannot be, uh, but we can't be more restrictive than than those if we wanted to be. Um, so okay. if once we redo the, sh the shorelands, uh, you know, bet before the 2023 timeframe, um, we'll prepare official plan amendments uh, associated with that review, bring them forward to council, council will review them and they, 
as, as per usual, you can uh, approve them, refuse them, or modify them, or, or send them back to, to staff for, for greater review. So, so in short, it, it fundamentally is uh, left once once it is um, once it is shall we say once it's gone live, uh, all of our amendments are firmly within municipal hands. Correct. Thank you. Okay, okay. so we're on um, section one here. The introduction. Are there any questions about that, Councillor Maynard? Thank you, Your Worship. Maybe just a comment. I'm looking, well, in our agenda is page 12, and the, the population and employment projections. <clears throat> so we see a, a, a very modest um, increase in the in the permanent population projected. <laughs> Councillor no. Maynard, you're you're jumping ahead here. Section, I'm in section one, am I not? No, you're in section two. We'll get to that in okay. I didn't My I didn't apologies. see any yet. I didn't see any other questions. Oh, nice. Sorry. My I didn't God. see any other questions on section one. So let's move to <laughs> section two. <laughs> Councillor Maynard. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, so you've got a, um, you know, a, a very modest uh, projection of permanent population increase coupled with a, um, more than doubling of the uh, seasonal population. So I'm assuming by seasonal, um, and excuse me if I haven't read every single line, uh, that um, that would be non-residents that are here only in the summer, not to, not tourists, right? Correct, yeah, just in the summer. Okay, so the, you, you also talk about, um, about the employment and, uh, <clears throat> I note that the tourist sector is uh, the word tourist or some form of tourism um, is mentioned um, copiously in this entire document. My question is with that population and the, um, and the growth for or the need for more people to employ, how do you, how, how do we square that? Sorry, I'm not to being overly clear, but how do, how do we square that? If we're going to have a, an, a couple of that with the decline, a significant decline in the age of the popular, well, in the number of young people. So how will we attract people to work in the service industry on a seasonal, you know, generally minimum wage type jobs with no benefits? Where, where, will, they, uh, where will they come from? And how do we make a, a healthy and livable community out of that scenario? Well, I, I guess it, there it may becomes... not be an answer. Just a comment is fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that that's up to us. Well, but what I'm and saying it, is, it, is we, we seem to be at odds, right, with our with our. Um, with our push to have uh, more hospitality type service industry type employment, but clearly it looks like we're going to have nobody to to uh, to fill those to fill those jobs. So how do we have a how do we promote an industry that we can't fill the jobs for? Well, I think that's a much larger question that council has to consider jobs creation as we are dealing with other big topics like affordable housing uh, madam yeah. cao no, sorry. okay madam cao you're on mute can't hear you Hmm. The CAO is tongue-tied. Okay, let's let's take some. <laughs> Good thing she's married to an IT guy. Let, let's take some. Uh, let's take some other questions until um, the CAO figures out her issue. Councillor Harper. 
Just a response to uh, Councillor Maynard. I guess the way I would look at it, Councillor Maynard, is that's the policy, what we want to do, and how we get there is the execution. So, you know, I don't think we can put the execution details in, in the document, but we got the policy to strive for. So that's how I'm looking at it. Councillor Hirsch, then Councillor McNaughton. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Very, very quickly, again, on Councillor Maynard's point. Um, Looking at these population projections, everyone I've shown these numbers to is flabbergasted at, at how low they seem to be. And I believe these numbers came from Watson and I believe they're several yeah. years old. If you, just, if, yeah, if you just look at the number of housing units that we are in the process of approving to be built in this county, um, there has to be um, a rather significant increase coming in the permanent population of the county. So I'm not sure how important this table is in terms of its accuracy for the whole plan, but I think those numbers are, are quite wrong. Okay. Councillor McNaughton and Councillor Nyman. Madam CAO, did you, have you figured out your audio? Can you hear me now? You, Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, to the mayor, to Councillor uh, Maynard and a few other councillors that have spoken. I, I, uh, I think Councillor Hurst, you're on the right track. This is a moment in time analysis that was done. Keep in mind that we have done the studies for this, this official plan for the last several years. It's taken us a long time to get here and we did not redo the analysis. What has uh, borne out in the last couple of years in particular is a different uh, trend line, both in terms of the population we're seeing attracted to the county as permanent residents, the, as well as the uh, age group of the people uh, interested in settling here, which is partly why we have the affordability conversation uh, sort of back in the, in the front seat. So uh, I would also just remind you that the official plan doesn't uh, is focused on how you use land. And so these uh, numbers in this section is really to provide some context as to why we value and think that these are the <coughs> things we need to save space for, uh, but it doesn't, uh, the official plan doesn't uh, affect our, it's not an economic plan or a strategic plan. It, it won't actually achieve those outcomes. It's about uh, how you see the landscape and the space and the land changing over time. Councillor McNaughton. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment further to Councillor Maynard's comment about affordability, but um, CAO Wallace has just done that. Okay. Councillor Nyman, then Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this may not be the right time to ask this, but I'm going to ask it. Um, Section two. And then ask another question, but uh, I've seen the table, it's 8,750 jobs, and I don't know if anybody can answer this, but how many of those jobs are full-time jobs? Because a full-time job in Prince Edward County through the tourism uh, sector is what, what I'm hearing people want to push for, is three or four part-time jobs. So, okay. That's the one question is how many full-time jobs are they? The other question is in the plan, is, is there um, some place that identifies industrial land? And if we have the opportunity to bring in light in industry, people don't want that, but we got to have full-time jobs here. So. That's two questions. Okay, well, let's, uh, I think the land use question about industrial land is whereabouts in the document. Mike, can you? If it's for in section four. Okay. I'll save that question. Okay, the question, the question about employment I'll refer to the uh, CAO who could provide perhaps some information and background about the Watson report that came before council in 2017. I'm not sure if there's any more clarification the CAO can provide about it. 
Uh, through the mayor to council, no, I, I don't have any more addition. I would just emphasize that that is uh, context for this plan. And uh, the, the plan is intended to acknowledge that tourism is a major part of our economy, uh, not necessarily uh, ascribing uh, merit to what, what kind of jobs and, and where, but just recognizing it is a reality in the economy and that we need to acknowledge there'll be land uses associated with that that need to uh, have a space here. Okay. All right, Councillor Maynard, and then uh, anybody else? Yeah. Okay. yeah, I'll try to be brief. And, and I recognize that this is not an economic development um, yep. document, although in, in, many, in many places it reads as such, and I, I get that it's uh, about land use, but if we are priori prioritizing land use for, um, for tourist, for tourist uh, ventures, then we are in fact setting, uh, setting the, uh, the path for what our economic uh, development will, will look like and which we may not uh, fall in line with what is best uh, further in, in one about uh, the, balancing the balancing the needs of the residents and the, uh, and the visitors. I just, I find throughout this document, and this was just kind of the very first part that I that I read, that um, that some of the preferential land use policies for tourist related activities are um, are somewhat uh, somewhat troubling to me. Where it may be easier to build a tourist resort on a piece of rural property than it is a home. Okay, we will. Get to that in section four. Anybody else for this particular section, section two, Councillor McNaughton, and then we'll move on. Thank you. So uh, on page, holy moly, where is it? Uh, page nine. Um, just thinking of some of the, just thinking of the vision statement, all new development will be compatible with its surrounding context, champion the protection of rural habitats and natural environment and where possible re reduce the climate impact of our decisions. Um, so some of the motherhood language here or some of the, some of the um, vision, visioning language here, um, I, I think it is, uh, should be sort of, uh, is represented in, in some places, um, the intent is represented some in some places in this document throughout in other places perhaps not not uh quite a lot of teeth but i'm just wondering um about uh making sure that those values are um adhered to does this document give uh, planners enough tools to say no to development that might be considered incompatible or odious because we do see some that we feel are incompatible uh, currently just the context for this question it relates to our, our existing OP and um, the uh, conflict inherent in the document where it seems to sort of let almost anything happen um, Will the planners with this document as sort of our top planning document have, once we, once we bring the other documents uh, and policies in line, um, will it offer enough uh, commitment and clarity for planners to say, no, not here? My opinion would be yes. This, this document has a lot more language in terms of uh, environmental protection in terms of allowing for growth within the rural areas, focusing development within our settlement areas. Um, so it's inherent upon the planner when upon speaking with somebody who wants to do something is to ask, well, is this the place, the best place to do that type of, uh, of, of business or build a house, whatever it might be. So that's, that's what needs to be ingrained in staff in terms of you have to ask that basic question, is this the right location? Um, you know, right now we, we're, 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 we're severing properties and then rezoning them all at the same time, which is disconcerting to, to, to me. Um, typically you would have one zone within the rural area that you would put a, a single family home into. 
um, and we seem to have a rezoning for each one, which uh, which is doesn't really compute with me. But nonetheless, as when we when we redo the uh, the zoning bylaw, we could we can deal with that one particular issue. But I think there's a, there's enough teeth in here to to ask developers to when, when we have those pre consultations, uh, and we do have a pre consultation section that sort of outlines how that process is and, and coming before council in, in the near future is again, what the planning process should look like uh, for our team. And, and that will, will set the ground rules and that you have these difficult conversations up front before an application even comes in the door. Uh, a lot of times what happens is an, an, an application is thrown in front of us without a pre-consultation or what might've happened in the past. And then you you end up, well, I guess I got to process it. Whereas if you have a, a good pre-consultation process, you might either be able to dissuade somebody, somebody from doing something on a certain piece of property and say, go and look at over in this direction. That makes more sense. And that's going to be supportable. If you do it here, I don't think I can support it. And I don't know what council is going to do. So then somebody before they actually throw in a lot of dollars towards the studies or actually build or buy the property, they'll go looking uh, elsewhere. Um, just as an aside, uh, when I was, was at the city of Gloucester, um, I tried to get as many of the real estate agents on my side as possible. So before they, they had a client buy property, I told them, because I had a geographic area within the city of Gloucester, uh, I said, come and talk to me before you do anything. Because your client could buy something that I'm just, I won't be able to support or council won't be able to support. So then I can give you that guidance. And it took, you know, a year before some of them started to show up a little bit more often after, the, you know, they, they made some deals that went bad. So um, this, this is kind of the thing that I would like uh, my, my team to be able to do and, 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 and think, uh, think twice about saying, just saying yes. We're, we're, not in, we're not in the business of saying yes, we're in the business of what are you trying to do? What do the policies say? And maybe the answer is no. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Bailey and Councillor Margotson. Michael, I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, it clarifies the bigger picture for me. I and my constituents don't necessarily want a subdivision on the side of a cliff in North Marysburg. Where you're suggesting is this gives us the opportunity to tell people it's not appropriate there. Again, I simply wanted to thank you for that statement. Councillor Margotson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just, coming back to Councillor Maynard's comments about tourism and some of the other things we've been talking about not maybe not specifically, but generally, I feel section two of the motion that's on the floor is a very important one, which is to prior in advance of 2023, we look at the shoreland designation. So we we scrutinize that designation and determine if if what were were um, the uses and the policies are appropriate in in regard to what our vision is, and also the cultural heritage master plan. I think that touches on a lot of things that could impact uh, our view of what we want the county to look like and then also development proposals. So I just bring in that highlighting that number two again because I feel it's very important and it will be considered in advance of 2023. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, then we're going to move to uh, section three, but we're going to take a 10 minute break. We've been here for two hours, so we'll be back at uh, 8 10. Chad, okay, or Mr. Clerk. Mr. Mayor, thank you. I heard that. Thank you. Okay, we're recessed till 8 10. 13 minutes.
Peter, but that's what it is. It's Rick is almost possible one from the new by the director who helps step in the face test. Fuck it, I made it. Extremely low risk way. Oh,
How are you doing, Michael? Can you hear me, Michael? Yep, sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. Yeah, no? How are you doing? All right. All right. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we won't be at this much longer. <laughs> Guys, we're still live on YouTube. Okay. Thank That's you. okay. Water cooler chat. I think you've got a bit of a long evening ahead of you, Mike. Sorry. All right. That's all right. It'll be what it is. You know, Mayor Ferguson, with the fan over your head, you look like you've got kind of almost like a crown. Or one of those beanie hats. <laughs> I think it looks more like a beanie hat. Yeah. I know. I was I was looking for a suitable background. I was going to go into Shire Hall, but unfortunately, things tend to um, break up in Shire Hall. And I haven't figured out a better backdrop without the beanie. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Clerk. 809. We're live. Are we, are we live now? Wait one more minute. Okay, we're live now, um, Chad. Through the mayor, yes. Okay, then we'll move on to uh, section three. I'll call the meeting back to order. <clears throat> and we'll proceed to uh, section three, shaping the county general development policies. And uh, let's see who questions or comments about um, this rather extensive section of the plan. Councillor McNaughton, followed by Councillor Hirsch. Uh, okay, Councillor McNaughton. Thank you. Uh, so with, uh, there's sort of some late breaking stuff going on uh, as in my um, uh, things that I'm learning about at least and how they, or things that have happened in the community or have been announced that have impacted some of my thinking about this plan. Um, and with the recent sort of under the objectives of this section regarding particularly um, objectives six and seven, uh, which relate to um, addressing the impacts of climate change and um, looking for opportunities for landscape restoration. Um, and I'm, uh, I, I'm interested in uh, actually, and I know many people want to see this approved tonight. I would actually like to see some language that apparently my cat does too, uh, see some language to, um, promote climate change strategies that uh, we, we could be undertaking within those objectives or that we could be making a commitment to within those objectives. Um, for example, that we could make a commitment to promote natural cover as a climate mitigation strategy uh, um, through various means, including um, creating opportunities for natural cover, um, you know, and uh, of course you wouldn't get that specific, but, uh, but through, um, offering lands uh, for natural cover or um, providing education and support for the community to restore lands and provide natural cover. So I don't know if, um, uh, if, if this does go back uh, tonight to staff for, um, for additional edits, I would, be putting that forward as uh, I, I would write it out <laughs> and put it forward as um, as an amendment. Um, anyway, I just, if I don't know, Mike, if you would have any comments regarding that or aside from, you know, uh, I well, don't let's, know. Where, let's ask where, staff. Mike, oh, there you go. Any comments about this? And 
just for clarity, Councillor McNaughton, can you refer to which which page you were uh, sorry were i should have done that page 19 objective six and seven uh, i think we do as a municipality have uh some clear opportunities to um create some mitigation strategies that that would uh involve the recent federal programs that were announced like the two billion trees commitment okay. all right i will ask the uh, manager of planning, if he's got any comments, Mike. I'm just thinking if policy 10 gives you some, some further guidance counselor in terms of some of the Ten? measures. Yes. Can you page, read that out? Cause I have to shift the cat. Yeah, sorry. So, uh, page 23, po policy 10. Uh, it's uh, the, the last sentence. Here we go give you a little bit of, of more information where enhancements can include the removal of invasive species, planting of trees and hedgerows, et cetera. I know it's perhaps not as- Well, I'm not thinking as the- as you want. Yeah, not a, a little more language of more commitment that says that we will connect, that we will take steps to educate and connect. So within that same, within that same sort of ideation, but, but a commitment. Yeah, in some respects, the simple policy of, of promoting more growth or directing more of our growth to the settlement areas will inherently protect uh, our sure. natural environments. Um, so you'll see more, more, I guess, fields remain in fallow or, or those that are sort of going through their second growth of forest that the, they'll, they'll mature or have an opportunity to mature as opposed to a severance going in there and um, cutting down the forest for their tree and a septic system and whatever backyard somebody might want. If you remember, there was um, a severance that came forward. I can't remember what road it was on, but um, maybe Councillor Nyman can help me here. In, we uh, it mistakenly indicated that, that we'd apply the, the, the policy for tree cover. Was it County Road 1? Uh, I can't remember the actual file, yeah. but what we were trying to do in that severance was there was a piece of piece of the property where that had trees and a piece of property that didn't have trees. So we were what we were trying to do is get the get the the landowner, the severer who was going to develop the house on the property to put the house on the where the trees were where the trees weren't, yeah. so that there was less trees removed for the housing. So, you know, there's stuff like that that we can, we can work on. Um, part of, as we go through subdivisions, and I think I've said this before for subdivisions and site plans, um, I always try and, and get as many trees as possible on the site. Um, you know, one of the policies we have right now is, is a tree per lot. Well, God, that's, that's nice, but um, you know, a lot of times for the corner lots, it's easy place to put two or three trees. So uh, when I when I review or or help or use my staff or or we look at different things uh, for subdivisions, we look for opportunities to to gain you know a little extra ability to plant some trees along the right of way where we can. Or um, if there's a large lot, then maybe we we try and uh, put more trees in there. Um, so, so I hear I hear what you're saying, which is we're trying to relate it specifically to land use, land use as it comes up for development, and the but the objectives are somewhat more aspirational, which is why I sort of thought having some language of commitment within those aspirational statements saying, and I'm and the tools could be determined, saying we will. Um, is of interest to me. I'm not going to put it forward at this time. I'll see how the meeting goes. But, um, but that's uh, something that emerged in my thinking when the 2 billion trees program was announced to try to encourage people uh, or to try to provide some direct education and direct connection for people through, through um, so that at lands that aren't being used for agriculture or that aren't natural features unto themselves actually become a natural feature. So that's sort of what I was thinking. Okay. Councillor Hirsch. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, of course, as one might expect, my comments are in respect of environmental issues. And in chapter three, there is one. I just want to preface it by saying that, that um, in the last few weeks, there's been tremendous engagement between the environmental organizations and, uh, and, and Mike Michaud, and, and that was very much appreciated. Um, even, even down to having a Zoom call where, where Mike had to you know, explain and defend his positions. And, and I think a number of the things that were asked for and all of council will have seen the, the rather large submission by the, the several environmental organizations. A lot of the things that were asked for have, have, um, have now been recommended and that's great. But not at all, of course. So uh, one I'd like to address, and this was addressed by um, Cheryl Anderson in her, uh, her comments, is the, uh, the wetland setback, which you'll find re referenced at 3.1.4 item two, which is on page 24. Nature specific the, um, the policies. version of the plan. Yep. Yes. Okay. So 3.1.4 sub two contains the famous 30 meter setback of a wetland. And I know that we know that that's what Quinty Conservation has used sort of forever as a, as a number, even though it's quite possible to have, you know, a higher number for a setback. And in fact, recently Environment Canada at the national level is recommending a 50 meter setback. And, and that's what, um, I'd like to see inserted here. And I guess to allay any fear that one might have, the paragraph does go on to say, if we, if we made that so that you, you cannot develop within 50 meters of an identified wetland of a feature, um, unless the ecological function of the feature has been evaluated through an EIS that demonstrates to the satisfaction of the county in consultation with community conservation, and any other agency that there will be no negative impact. So in other words, just like today, the 30 meters can be um, reduced if, if an impact statement shows that it's not going to harm anything, we would suggest let's make it 50, which just challenges developers um, a little more to identify you know, why they need to build inside that 50. So at this point, Mr. Mayor, I don't know if I need to make that a motion to make this change or if we're going to well, let's. You know, I don't know what council's appetite is for that, or how you want to to handle this. Okay, I, what I would propose is let's see what the manager of planning has to say about this, and then we will seek guidance from from the CAO as to um, <clears throat> your proposal and others that might arise as we go through the plan. So let's hear what. Sorry. Um, your Worship, could I get clarification on that section again? I'm looking at a hard copy here and I don't think the pages page, could not be lining up. Page 24 of the hard copy. It's section, section. 314. Mm -hmm. two. Two. Clause okay. 2. Paragraph 2. Thank you. That's what I'm looking for, yeah. <clears throat> Yep, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, Mr. Mayor, through, through you to Councillor Hirsch. Um, sure. In, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, 3.1.4 sub 2. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's, I think he's got it, Councillor Hirsch. So he's responding. Yeah. The uh, Councillor Hirsch is quite right in that uh, 30 meters is the absolute minimum that, um, that you can. Uh, use as your setback to uh, uh, some sort of wetland feature, uh, but that's provided an, an, an appropriate EIS demonstrates that that's the, the minimum setback. Um, moving it to 50, is it the, the absolute end of the world? No, uh, but my guess is you'll, you'll get a lot of EISs that'll suggest that you can go to 30 anyways. Um, it's just been the, the, the norm within the, the, the industry of um, once, when they do the EISs, if there's no real particular issue, um, the 30 meter setback is something that's, that's, that's the fallback and that's, that's sort of where most of these things end up. Um, 
you know, w w when you do your site planning as well, you might get a 30 meter setback, but when you do your site planning, uh, you know, you, you can easily push that to, you know, 40 meters with, by making, um, you know, a, a, a vegetative buffer along that edge that might be adjacent to a parking facility or a driveway, that sort of thing. So even though it might be 30 meters, you can through, a, you know, a site planning or a subdivision development, you can in some way try and, and, and push that uh, to a greater number. Okay. But going to 50, it just, as Councillor Hurst suggested, it just makes the developer work a little bit harder to try and get to that 30, which is where everybody tries to get to anyways. So, so Councillor Hirsch, <clears throat> what is it your, I see your hand, Councillor Nyman, I've got sorry. you down next. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, I, I was just kicked out of the meeting for the last couple of minutes and just barely got back in, so I, I did not hear what... Um, what the manager said. Okay, I'll ask, I'll ask him to paraphrase. Oh, yeah, um, indeed, Councillor Hirsch, you're correct in that the, the 30 meters is the absolute minimum where uh, that's supportable through an EIS. It's typically where we end up. Uh, through site planning, um, we can typically increase that just from proper site planning of creating a vegetative buffer along that edge, or if we do uh, redoing the zoning uh, amendment or zoning bylaw, you know, we could introduce uh, setbacks from from certain uh, wetland features um, above and beyond the, the 30 meters, so that they they actually have to create a vegetative buffer, um, you know, of five meters or 10 meters, whatever it ends up being in, in the zoning bylaw. Um, so you'd end up with your 30 meter setback plus a vegetative buffer of five, 10 meters. Uh, and then you would get into, you know, parking lot facilities or a building or, or a driveway or something to that effect. Um, 50 meters, you could, you know, you could, you could put that out there. Um, and that'll just make the, uh, the, the EISs a little bit more complete perhaps, or, or as you say, get the developers thinking a little bit more. Thank you, Michael. Did you get that, Councillor Hirsch? Yes, thank you. So um, I guess what you're okay. suggesting then is that what we're trying to accomplish here could be done through the comprehensive zoning bylaw um, on a case-by-case on a -case basis or zone-by-zone -zone basis rather than making this overall statement in the official plan. Is that the idea? Uh, that that's one way of, of sort of remedying it, um, as, as you suggested, and, you, and you're quite uh, correct in your, your suggestion that, uh, you know, most EISs will, will get you to that 30 meter setback, but in, a, in the zoning bylaw review, we, we, can, we can make uh, a, a zoning setback for, you know, if you're adjacent, if the property line is adjacent to a wetland feature, then a five meter buffer strip shall be implemented along that, uh, that property line. You know something like that, so you end up at a 35 or maybe a 40 meter, depending on 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 what council feels is is a is a right vegetative buffer, and that might be a, a vegetative buffer of natural grasses and 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 trees, or it might be a tree buffer. Um, you know, we can come up with different things, I guess. Okay, okay. Councillor Hirsch, that answer your question. Well, think about I guess it. I'm just not sure how to proceed, whether, whether whether we need to bring this to a decision at this point or um, or leave it to the comprehensive zoning bylaw. Well, why don't you think about that? And um, while I take another question, uh, which will come from Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Michael, just on that, uh, uh, one file you were talking about where the trees were, that was in North Marysburg, where the, uh, about the, where you, they wanted to put the house. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just have um, two questions, if I could, Mr. Mayor. Um, yep. Go ahead, Councilor Nyman. So uh, one is on uh, page 25, the Waring's Creek uh, 
sub watershed is there's only two little uh, paragraphs in there. It, and I don't really see where it's um, saying that uh, the county wants to protect um, that watershed. Is, is there, can we get some kind of language in there that will um, enforce that we really want to protect that watershed? I go out. I note that there was a change made, but go ahead if you'd like to respond to Councillor Nyman. Mike, it's top of 26. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I see I'm just rereading the policy just to refresh my mind. I think There's it's more policy in 16 <clears throat> that, that sort of lends, it, lends itself to protecting the creek itself where it says in the second sentence, no development shall occur within the riparian area, extending a minimum of 30 meters from the top of bank. There's more language in the secondary plan. It's, yeah. If we could hear from um, Mr. Michaud, please. So, uh, Follow up, Councilor Nyman. Uh, look, I'm, just, I'm reading what uh, Michael has just said there. So. The 30 meters that um, was just discussed by Councillor Hurston, that references it here too. Um, would that be changed to the 50 meters for the Waring's Creek watershed too? That that's that's up to council. Uh, if if council wishes a 50 meter setback, then then one could be put in place. 30 meters again is is sort of the minimum that uh, that's typical. If um, if it was just a sort of a, a normal warm water stream, uh, most conservation authorities allow you to go down to 15 meters. But given that it's a, a uh, cold water fishery, uh, 30 meters is is something that's uh, that the I guess the conservation authority is is comfortable with. Okay, thank you. Uh, so. But Go ahead, and then I've got a question about this. Okay, so I'm, I was just going to say maybe uh, when Councillor Hirsch decides how he wants to proceed, maybe he could include in his motion the Waring's Creek 50, uh, 50 meter also to make it easier. But okay. um, Mike, just for clarification about this, if a development was coming forward to Council for a decision, would the staff make the recommend recommendations or point out the options about the, um, you know, that 30 meter or other setbacks. So council could decide as opposed to uh, referring to memory or if there's a change of council when this comes forward. Is that how the, the planning application would come forward or is it more prudent to really formalize this in the document. You're referring to the 50 meter setback versus a 30? Correct. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for, formalizing the 50 would, would simply, you'd, you put in wording 50 subject to an EIS, right? So what you're telling the developer is you, you're, you're gonna be set back 50 meters from that wetland but unless you do an EIS that proves that the ecological function of that wetland is not going to be interrupted or disturbed or mitigated, not mitigated, but uh, uh, sort of get be harmed in any way, shape, or form from either development, then um, your EIS could, could bring you down to a 30 meters, which is typically supportable from the conservation authority um, that typically peer reviews okay. a lot of our, our, our studies. Okay. All right. So let's see. Um, when I get back, hang on, Councillor Hirsch, we'll get back to you in a sec here. I think Councillor Harper's got a question. Madam CAO, did you have a point of clarification? No? Okay. Councillor Harper. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Mike, is there any downside in going to 50 from 30? Um, I don't think so. No, no, because it's predicated on an EIS. So 
it just gives us a little bit more ammunition, being us as the county, uh, that if the EIS can't show uh, that the a development won't impact the ecological function of the of the of the wetland or whatever natural feature is there, uh, then the then it's 50 meters. Yeah. You know? So, um, you know, it, it gives council that that little that little bit of extra edge that if uh, they're not happy with the developer in, in terms of what they're proposing in, in, in terms of an EIS, then uh, then you can say, you know, it's gonna be 50 meters and, and thank you very much. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, so we've got, or right, there are any other questions about, well, let's go back to Councillor Hirsch and Councillor Nyman has his hand up as well. And then Councillor Thank Maynard. you, Mr. Mayor. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, this has been crystallized in my mind now. It seems to me that uh, with, with 50, uh, a, a suitable EIS or decision by planning and council can, can reduce that. But if it's 30, you can never increase it. So the way all the language is in, in both of these cases, in sub-item 2 and sub-item 16 that Councillor Nyman's talking about, if we... If we leave it at 30, it means we can, we can never insist on a greater buffer. So if you make it 50, it can be reduced, and, uh, but the desirable limit is 50. So I, I, I am prepared to make a motion, if it's appropriate, um, to amend 3.1.4 subsection 2 and subsection 16 to replace 30 meters with 50 meters. I think Let it's me, as simple um... as that. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me seek guidance from either the CAO or the clerk. Madam, start with Madam CAO. Sure, through the mayor to it's council. So you could, um, you can take, it's your prerogative. So you can take motions um, and vote on amendments to the motions as we go section by section, or we could wait, get through the five sections and then um, table all the motions together. Uh, that might be cleaner. I might recommend putting them all together at the end, just so that you see how much amendments you're proposing. Yeah. That's okay fine. with you, Kyle? That, okay. That okay with you, Councillor Nyman? Yeah, okay. Councillor Maynard. Councillor Maynard. Thank you. Yeah. So that's all development. That's any and all development, any building parcel that's going on. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Um, I get maybe for uh, major for major development, but uh, we are going to make rich people that do EISs, and uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, for the uh, this will be okay for people that are uh, have the, the, the deeper pockets that are doing larger developments, <clears throat> but for um, for the for the one-off home builder will be uh, will be will be difficult between the EISs and the um, and the hydro Gs and the other studies that we will request. So I, I mean I could support it with a larger development, but maybe not if you're building a a small house. Okay, well, let's hold that until we get to the uh, the motion. You can bring that comment forward. Okay. Well, I have the mic. Buddy I did Cal. have a question on that in this section, if I could. Uh, that, that was for clarification. Yeah. I am looking at three point three point sorry three point one point six. D, where I'm going to go back again to the, the tourist commercial development, uh, Con industrial development, etc. Constraint et area? Um, constraint area policies? Sorry. Natural, no, yes, constraint areas, yes, correct. I've got page, page 22. 29. 6.0, six, and then subsection C. Natural environment is one of the most important considerations. Subsection C. Yeah. What is the heading of that? Tourist commercial development. Okay. Okay. Hey. 
<laughs> anyway. well, just my, my question is, is that my comment, I guess, is that uh, tourist commercial and development industrial and other major developments have a greater potential for adverse impacts on the natural environment. Um, but then it says, you know, as long as you plan to ensure that there are no negative impacts on the natural environment. I don't know how you ever ensure that there's no, I can see that you minimize the impacts of the environment. But uh, I would suggest in tourist commercial development, I mean, between aquifers and that they're likely to have a higher, you know, they'll have, they'll at least have some negative impact on the, uh, on the natural environment. I just. Uh, what page, Janice? I've got page 22 in the hard copy. 22. Well, that's what it, that's how it's numbered for me. Thank you. And it is that it says uh, four schedule C constraint areas, and then it goes five, and number six is natural environment. It's one of the most and constraint important. area policies is on page twenty nine in mine. Well, I think I think we're in three one three six C. Yes, 316C. 3136C. 313. So I have the updated version printed. Maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> We're not maybe on the same page. Well, mine clearly says page 22 on the bottom. Yeah, bottom of 22. Yeah, I think it's just, it's 313. Paragraph six. Found it. Just looking. Okay. I, I'm still trying to uh, to square um, having commercial tourist commercial development. Uh, how we promote that in the uh, in the rural areas when we know that there will be that there will be. Um, negative impacts greater than some other types of development. Okay, let's, Mike? Comments? I think you gotta go back to the, the second sentence of policy six, which talks about the plan promotes the following general approaches. So generally we're trying to do this stuff, but there may be instances where we won't be able to do, or, or the natural environment won't be pristine in terms of what it used to be in advance of this, the development. You know, from a stormwater and aquifer re recharging point of view, I mean, um, Slonzer is not impervious uh, type of materials. Uh, you know, the water hits the top of the trailer or the tourist resort or the tent or whatever it does roll back onto the ground and then and, and finds its way um, to an outlet of some sort and, and does recharge the aquifer. Um, they, they tend to, you know, in, in the summertime be a little bit more, uh, if you're looking at a tourist commercial resort, you, they, they do have impacts during the summer season, uh, but the bulk of the year when there's, when there's less tourist activity, these things are fairly porous in terms of the ability for the, the fauna to, to utilize the property to hunt or, or to go from spot to spot. So um, again, it's, it, it's a general approach. Um, you know, you, you do your EIS to, to justify um, where you might set up the, uh, the tourist location or the industrial park or whatever it might be. Um, such that you, you know, you mitigate your, your, uh, your impacts on the natural environment. Okay, Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, on page 32, uh, the flood lines. So, the floodlines, is that the 100-year the floodplain? 
And um, are we saying that there is no development in that floodplain, the hundred year floodplain? Or Correct. That, that's like, uh, the hundred year floodplain is something mapped by the conservation authority. And they do have funding or they received funding to do some, some further floodway or floodplain mapping within the county. So once that mapping, uh, I guess, is done or that study is done, we'll have some new regulatory uh, setbacks that we'll be able to utilize for different properties wherever they're doing their study. Quick follow up if I could. Yep. So, um, Basically, what we're saying is that if you fall or if, um, if you bought a piece of land and that floodplain is halfway up your land, we're not going to allow you to build in the floodplain. That, Correct. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm clear on that part of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank now, you. now what, what does happen, just to, to add some more information, Councillor Nyman, is that a lot of times these flood maps are... 15, 20 years old, um, so they're a little out, out of date. So you'll have developers that'll, that'll go in and do some studies to determine where that flood line is. Uh, there's a perfect example up here in Ottawa, in Barhaven, uh, along the Jock River, where a developer went in, did a lot of flow monitor, monitoring upstream and downstream, uh, and was able to uh, move the floodplain uh, to their benefit, and, and now they're going to be developing about a thousand homes. So, depending on on the age of the flood mapping and and what the the information is, um, you know, uh, it's only as robust as the study uh, was done. So, jeez, thank you. Okay, other questions on section three. Okay, let's move to section four. Councillor Maynard, have you got a question about yes, three or no, four? Yeah, three. And it's it's just a quick comment that the floodplain okay. mapping um, monies are for very is, is very limited in scope and will not be doing all of the floodplain uh, mapping for the entire county. I think it was for a portion of Lane Creek, actually. So we've got so when it comes to mapping, I think that's something that we really will have to look at not only for our uh, floodplains, but where our uh, natural core areas are, where our linkages are. I'm just saying that this is a good, going to be a hugely expensive um, endeavor that will take place over time. And until then, we, I don't think we really do have good, uh, good mapping data in a lot of instances. Okay, okay let's move on to section four. County land use designation. I'm sorry, I had my hand up, but put it down when Council Maynard was speaking. Councilor so, McNaughton. Thank you. Um, so uh, there's language uh, on and uh, 3.3.3 under housing policies. That's also referred to uh, in the intent of uh, under 3.3. 3.1 regarding um, housing mix. Uh, and I'm just wondering uh, if, um, if it would, if any, any of the wording here would require developments to include, um, to include an actual, uh, compre not comprehensive, obviously, but um, to uh, sort of provide a mix per development. So I understand that the details would come with the zoning bylaw, um, but I'm just looking for clarity as to um, what's, how far we would need to go to with the wording here, does it go far enough to to sort of dictate when we do go to uh, reevaluate the zoning bylaw um, to say that we uh, could be looking at uh, providing, uh, requiring developers to provide uh, a certain type of housing mix on every single development. Mike? Yeah, I don't think the policy structure 
is in that that vein in terms of each development has to have a, a large mix. So it has, has to have a certain amount of singles, a certain amount of of uh, towns or stacked town townhouses. Um, I think that level of um, of of detail might be left best to a secondary plan. Um, not not the zoning bylaw, but a secondary plan. Well, a secondary plan. You'll end up with areas right. that are that are lower density and higher density. Um, so that that that, I guess that granular granularity will 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 be brought out in a secondary plan, and then okay. your zoning bylaw will then implement that. Thank you. Um, and then uh, just a quick follow up. Um, clause nine on page. 52, a residential lot may have either a secondary unit or a garden suite, but not both at the same time. Um, does that require, um, does that require mentioning? Cause I would prefer to see that struck in case, uh, in case we ever reevaluate the, um, the bylaw related to secondary suites. Yeah, I believe the reason that policy is written that way is if, if you had your normal house, and then you had a secondary unit in the basement, and then you had a garden suite in the back, you'd be looking at a minimum two parking spaces for the house, one space for the secondary unit, one space for the garden un unit. So you're looking at four parking yes. spaces. Four parking spaces. I, under, I and, understand. And most lots are not gonna be able to, to, to deal with that or, or handle that amount of parking, off street parking. So as we go through the zoning bylaw, um, you know, we can have that discussion on whether garden suites have a parking space allotted to them or not. Uh, we can also have a discussion in terms of allowing homeowners to purchase parking along the street, um, basically a license uh, the, you know, that they put in, the, put in their dashboard to, that allows them to park on the street overnight. Um, so we can have those discussions that yep. allow for these types of units without impacting uh, the property and its ability to not only have the units, but also have the parking associated with the units. So I understand right. its inclusion in, 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 the, um, in the bylaw itself and in the zoning bylaw. I'm just wondering if it needs to be mentioned here in this case, or if zone, or if um, item nine is getting, a, Speaking of granularity, uh, if if it's a hint of unnecessary granularity, because if we ever do go to reevaluate that, um, I mean, we would likely have to do some sort of OPA at the time. But it, that specific one, and I see Matt, that uh, CAO Wallace has her hand up. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm I see her too, Councillor McNaughton. I was waiting for you to finish the sentence, and then I was going to ask. Thank you, Madam <laughs> CAO. Madam CAO. Sorry, I wasn't sure if the sentence was finished. So uh, <laughs> through, the it mayor, wasn't, but... through the mayor to Councillor McNaughton, um, I would, uh, I, I hear what you're saying. I would just uh, remind uh, everyone, given the conversation we had on short-term accommodations, the um, council has directed staff to come back with a bylaw, which we are hoping to come back towards uh, sometime in March. And uh, at the time, uh, as part of the motion, it will also talk about um, a, where we think we could go with a, amendments on the planning side. So I think there's actually, uh, in the early conversations, quite a lot of edits, both uh, that potentially might need to happen to the official plan, but more likely the zoning bylaw that was put in place for the STA program uh, um, and our reliance on zoning to implement the STA program under its current format uh, is probably uh, part of what we have to reconsider. So I think there'll be a lot of edits uh, and we can certainly take the official plan in the con in the context at that time, but uh, I, I don't see that this line in particular uh, would prevent where we need to go um, to, to meet council's objectives on, on that subject uh, based on the last conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to section four now, county land use designations and um, another robust section. So we've got Councillor Nyman, Councillor Bailey, Councillor Hirsch, 
in that order. Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this, uh, my standing question from earlier on, um, I think I have found a bit of uh, information where it says the industrial land, <coughs> but is it my understanding then that um, industrial is allowed in villages and hamlets? Um, as well as uh, the urban centers. Mike, are you referring to a page in the plan, yeah. Councillor Nyman? I got page 92 it is the village uh, designation. And the actual industrial part of it is uh, on page 93 um, I. Page 93 I. Right at the top of the page here. And that's for uh, villages, uh, the, the village designation. And then the hamlet is the, the next uh, page 94. Actually, for the Hamlet one, it is um, on page 95 uh, K, but I didn't see nothing in the urban centers that references in industrial. Um, Let's see it in the Hamlets. <clears throat> Objective two and four point one one. Um, talks about employment growth. So employment growth is part of that would be industrial or permit industrial. Four point two. Sorry, Michael, that was 4.11? 4.211. Uh, no, 4.11 objective two speaks to employment oh. growth. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Councilor Nyman. Madam CAO. Just maybe to help uh, Mike out a little bit, I would just emphasize the way the plan is constructed. Uh, the plan is specific about the types of uses for hamlets and villages because they don't have secondary plans. So it's yeah. trying to give you a scale of what you're allowed to do in those places. Uh, whereas if you read the section for urban, it speaks to um, secondary plans and that's where the level of detail on how the objective that Mike has uh, pointed out is actually translated in the areas of like a, a Wellington or a Picton, for example. Okay. Okay. Councillor Bailey. It, actually, Mr. Mayor, if I could, just to finish off that, okay. I did find something in, in section 4.1.4, policy six. The county may consider small scale commercial industrial uses that exceed the maximum ground floor plate. And it goes on and on. And that's for additional policies for villages and hamlets. So as, as uh, CAO Wallace indicated, the, the urban centers uh, or some of the settlement areas with uh, infrastructure have secondary plans that, that do incorporate uh, industrial uses within the secondary plans. Likewise, this policy, policy 4.1.46, does talk about some industrial uses um, within the villages and hamlets. And the hamlets. Okay. Okay. Thank Councilor you. Bailey. Thank you, Your Worship. Michael, I'm on 4.5.4 and 4.5.5. And the page I'm looking on on my computer screen is 129. I don't know if that's accurate to what you're looking at, but it's natural core areas and natural core linkages. So on, 
Can you, the, the clause section number four point what? 4.5.4. Okay. And it's followed by 4.5.5. Got it. My question has to do with paragraph three in both. Uh, paragraph three and 4.5.4 .4 speaks of limited residential development and 4.5.5 .5 speaks of low density development. What's the difference? Um, there really isn't, it's just different terminology. The, okay. the, idea for, the idea for both is that the development, residential development happens by way of severance within Correct. both. Because we're, we're the, the bigger policy um, later on prohibits um, plans of subdivision and condominium within the within the aggregate designation, the shoreland designation, the waterfront designation, and, and the rural designation. Because what I'd like to propose is that in 4.5.5, uh, much along the lines of what Amy Bodman spoke of, I'd like to see paragraph three and four taken out and paragraph three from 4.5.4 .4 put in. Okay, so, you, um, so I understand what, what you're looking to do is... Stop major uh, development in those areas. Yeah, so in, in the linkages, you don't want major development that takes place that requires an official plan amendment. Correct. Ma major development that doesn't require an official plan amendment is still permitted. How do we stop both? Uh, you have to take out the reference to uh, official plan amendment in, in 4543 and then replicate that in 455. So you just say major development outside of a settlement area, it will not be permitted. So you, you remove and which requires an official plan amendment, which is, which is uh, a phrase that's been in this official plan before I even arrived to the county. If that's the way it would work best, then that's what I would like to try to do. Okay, well, you're, this, is a, this is a motion you'd have to bring forward. Okay, if somebody can remember the wording. <laughs> I've, got it, I've got it roughly written down. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Bailey, if, if I may, you, I think you just have to remove and which requires an official plan amendment. And I think you have what you're, what you're proposing. Okay, well, let's... Um, um, We'll put that on to at the end of the discussion and we'll consider that along with the uh, the other one. Uh, Thank you, Michael, got it. Uh, Councillor Hirsch. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, Councillor Bailey stole my thunder. Um, I was going to talk about the exact same items, but part of what he referred to is is uh, is important too, and that is um, Amy Bodman spoke uh, rather eloquently about the importance of linkages, and so what Councillor Bailey said in the in the first instance in his um, intervention was that four point five point five sub three and four should be replaced by paragraph sub three from 4.5.4. So in other words, the same rules apply for um, linkages as for NCAs right. themselves. And then, that and then that removal of the OPA wording would be a, a second piece of that. That's it, John. Yep. Correct. Okay. All right, other questions? Councillor Maynard. Thank you. Um, well, I appreciate the the intent of, of, of trying to um, mitigate uh, the impact until we have um, properly and defined linkages. I just don't, I mean, like these are really still squiggles on the map. I mean, we don't even really have good mapping of our core areas, let alone our, let alone our linkages. So I don't even know how like, 
how a lot of staff, how would it even be enforced? Like, I mean, these aren't, these are just um, best guesstimates and, and barely even that. I mean, we don't know how, I mean, unless you're gonna start doing some kind of a tracking exercise, how do you know where those linkages are that we are now going to try and regulate? So if, you're, you're yeah. talking about the lack of def. Just if I could finish, mm -hmm. you're talking mm -hmm. about the lack of definition of the linkage areas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yes. Who'd like to handle it? Mike, Madam CIO. Yeah, um, I think Councillor Maynard spoke uh, of. Uh, so, somewhat of what's taken place with the natural core areas and that, you know, they, they were recommended and drawn by our envir environmental consultant. Um, but again, it's uh, at a very high level. Um, the, the, the ground truth thing did, you know, didn't take place. Uh, hence the reasoning for the, the greater emphasis of an EIS part of development to, to understand where that line is. Much like we are today, we have a lot of, uh, of lands that are zoned EP, but they aren't ground truth. So um, developers go and do an EIS and, uh, and, and that line gets moved because the, the mapping was done at such a high level that when you actually ground truth it, the, the line can move um, by um, you know tens of meters um, in a lot of cases. So, um, Councillor Councillor Maynard is, is correct in that uh, you know the, the lines are are somewhat symbolic. They 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 do capture a lot of the natural core, core area. Absolutely, um, do they represent the the absolute line? Probably not. I would just so I was asking that, and I mean beyond right. the core areas is the is the linkages because I yeah. would say that they are are really they're not defined in any meaningful way. So how do we regulate what we, what we can't define? Or can we regulate what we really can't define? Okay. Can we? <laughs> I guess, is that, is that a question? Yes, how, how, can, how can we, sorry. Yeah, it's it's like I say, it's it's our it's a it's the an educated guess from an environmental environmentalist where where those linkage lines are, are best to be located. Um, again, they need to be ground truth as part of a uh, an application uh, to determine where that line is best represented. That's yeah. a reasonable undertaking. Hey. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Councillor St. Jean. I've got another question, but I'll wait. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Maynard, for, for raising that uh, very important question. Uh, you have gray areas that have been defined with a very broad brush stroke, and then you've got gray, even grayer areas that may or may not be valid linkages. Um, I think all of that is best left to a, a proper EIS and uh, definitely uh, leave, leaving this as it is, is probably the best way to do it because you, how do you regulate something that you don't know if it really exists, I think is what Councillor Maynard was saying. And that makes absolutely no sense. I think, you know, I haven't said a whole lot lately, but th this just does not make sense. Uh, leave it as is, and when, when the motion comes forward, I will absolutely be voting against it. I think it, we need to be reasonable, and we need to be progressive, but we need to be reasonable more than anything. And this, as it's written, is reasonable because it requires environmental impact studies on the ground, not just somebody sitting at a laptop. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Okay, Councillor Maynard, and then we'll move on. It's it's a big it's a big section, Your Worship. I wish we had a different format where we could have uh, done this, but uh, this is what we have. So, 
Um, I have page 92, 4.1.2, the village designations. Um, it's the intent of this plan to promote the function of villages as urban settlement areas with a mix of houses and businesses with uh, community uses. Villages are intended to prioritize municipal services, infrastructure, tourism, and amenities for tourists and businesses catering to tourists. Um, that language might be a little strong for my, like, you know, I, I get, you know, commercial businesses, but to highlight and underline the word, uh, again, tourism, um, I, I wonder whether um, some of those that are listed in villages, if that's really what they want to see in their in their community, or if they're even positioned to to do that, I would be, you know, it just seems that it's, uh, yeah. So just, just it's, it's to... a little too it's a little too prescriptive for my liking, you know, businesses. Small, so scale, small scale commercial uses with, that it says further on in 4.1.2.1K, but to uh, specifically um, indicate that that uh, we're open for all manner of tourist amenities and business catering to tourists. I, I'm not sure that that's really what, uh, what the people in the, um, in the small villages are, uh, are looking for. So as we try and balance the needs, I think that that uh, suggests that that whole sentence could be removed and just say, uh, you know, small scale commercial. Okay, while you think about that, uh, Michael, I, we need a uh, motion to extend. We've gone past three hours. We have a mover and a seconder, Councillor Bailey, seconded by Councillor Margotson. All those in favor? That carries. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, the, the term tourism was, was added to this particular section um, just to emphasize the whole idea of amenities for tourists and businesses catering yes. to tourists. Um, yeah. It just puts a little bit more em emphasis on that. And, and it just, it promotes, I guess, greater business development within our villages and, and once you start having one or two businesses, it, it tends to be an incubator for other businesses. And then you, you start to have something a little bit greater within your village, which is where you want your development to take place. You, maybe, maybe you can create a, a, a main street that uh, makes sense for Cherry Valley or, or for Ameliasburg, or uh, you end up something that, that uh, starts to grow and, and to develop and provides op, you know business opportunities and provides employment opportunities for those villages. So instead of instead of things being maybe scattered throughout the rural area or, or stuck along the shoreline, uh, this just tries to emphasize that you know the, the plan tries to put tourism in a lot of different places as opposed to the current plan, which tries to jam it all into the the shoreline and the shoreland designation. Okay, I will just say that as a part of the overarching um, goal of having a livable community, the commercial that we get, we would like, uh, uh, seems to be the sense, but what we want is a year round um, commercial enterprises that, uh, that serve the, the residents. And uh, because they often end up being two quite different types of, uh, of commercial establishments that are perhaps right. open for six, seven months and then shuttered the rest of the year. Don't provide year round employment and aren't really of a whole lot of use to the, uh, to the, to the residents of the, uh, of, the, of the said villages. I'd prefer that that sentence be, be struck and replaced with uh, with a uh, with small scale commercial uses, and I'll try and make a note of what page that is when it comes to that time. Uh, I wish we had a uh, we we need somebody to page ninety two. Yes, I know, but <laughs> the actual okay. Page thank you. ninety two, Madam CAO. Yes, I know that. Yeah, thank you.
Councillor Harper. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I guess I was reading that and I, I, I guess I kind of zeroed in on, it's just, uh, it's this idea that uh, you, it could have these things, but it's at a scale that preserves existing village character. So for me, that's the question is, or the issue is village character. And, and you have that as an out if you don't think it suits your village character, so. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Councillor St. Jean. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, page 111, uh, section 4.3.1.2, uh, back to 111, uh, section, subsection 20I, uh, with regards to it says development shall at all times be a three season development, not including the winter season. Would it not be more appropriate to be specific about uh, what those time frames are? And, and when this is, this has to do obviously with the uh, uh, shoreland properties and uses, trailer parks, I guess. Uh, most of them already are specific about a, a, a date, whether it be April 1st or November 1st, something like that. I find this a little bit vague when you say by the season. So then are we going to follow the calendar season? Uh, I'd be more comfortable if it was a specific date, start and end, just for clarity more than anything there. Any com? Uh, do, do you have an opinion, Mike? I guess that would be my question. No, I, and uh, um, no, in that uh, I, 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 I don't have any sort of Brotherings as to putting in actual dates. I think that that's fine. That's appropriate because most, most of them do have their dates associated with an EA for their septic systems and that sort of thing anyways. So um, mm -hmm. th those dates are, are, are fixed and prescribed. Um, so they could be put into place. Um, you know, what we we're just, what we were trying to capture here was just the seasonality of, yeah. of, of what the, the uh, tourist recreational facilities are, um, you know, uh, with Quindy Isle, there's a, there's a huge discussion of whether or not it is, uh, you know, a three season type of development. So we, we were trying to put language in there that would um, sort of meet that test or or tell developers that as they come in that, you know, if you're doing this type of development, you know, it, it's only three season. It's a uh, and, and that's what the the residents want and that's what the what it's planned for um that being said um we should also give some thought and i and, and i must admit i haven't given it a whole lot of thought in terms of how do you deal with with a with a developer that uh, does promote something that's four seasons so in the winter time they have dog sledding or you know i know ice fishing used to be popular but they don't get you don't get the ice as much anymore, but maybe there's other types of events um, in the winter season that uh, will be touristic in some sort of way, shape, or form, and it ends up being four seasons. So, would that type of facility need an official plan amendment? Is that is that how council wants to look at these things, or do we want to put language in here that sort of deals with those four season type of resorts? I would think that, you know, I think it's quite possible we're going to see more four season opportunities. And maybe the option is we just eliminate that, knowing that the bigger tourist facilities, they do have their EAs and they're, they're, they're simply stuck with that. And maybe that gets implemented in a zoning bylaw for any future um, future endeavor in that respect. I guess that's another yeah. option. Okay. Well, Thank you. I did, I'm, I'm just it. overly not, I'm not comfortable <laughs> with that particular set, uh, section uh, being in there for it just, it either needs to be clarified or eliminated uh, in my view, I guess. So. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about this at the end of that one as well, make a decision at, at that time. Um, 
Okay, don't see anyone else. So we'll move on to section five. And I just know that there is going to be conversation about 5.2.4. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd, I'd like to address exactly what you just said, 5.2.4, and I'd like to encourage Councillor Margitson to do the big reveal. <laughs> Councillor Margitson. <clears throat> Well, I've already said that I had a motion prepared to amend 5.2.4, one, which was to remove that pol policy and replace it with application submitted and deemed complete before July 6, 2021, shall be reviewed under the existing 2006 official plan. Applications that are missing one report based on seasonality may also be reviewed under the existing 2006 official plan subject to the applicant submitting an application containing all the other required reports, documents, and fees such that it could be deemed complete subject to the missing report. So okay, well that's, <clears throat> that's, that, that's the, uh, the, the motion that you want, you want to make concerning the transition policy. Correct. When, and when it could be embedded okay. with all those other other um, changes that have been proposed, or it could be separate. So. But ours is nicely written out. <laughs> ours is nicely written out, yeah. And makes sense, hopefully, too. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, Mike, have you, see, have, you, uh, have you seen this the, the proposal? Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's fine. If that's uh, the will okay. of council, that, that's fine. Okay. Well, let's, let's hold on to that for a minute and see if there's any discussion. Any discussion about any other items in five point, uh, section 5.0. Councillor McNaughton. Thank you. Uh, I actually just wanted to uh, thank staff for creating a terms of reference for environmental impact studies. I think it's a, a great step in the right direction. And, um, and I, I imagine we'll see how it, how it lives on the ground before, before we can um, sort of um, have, have some review and understand where it's working and where it could use strengthening. I'm just wondering if that is something that we can adopt in advance uh, of it, that we need to wait for the um, OP to adopt, or if that's something that we can actually adopt as a policy independently um, quite easily. Um, Mike, go ahead. Yep, I was just gonna say if, if uh, again, if, if council is uh, enjoys the the terms of reference for the EIS, um, it'd be fairly simple to, uh, I guess, have some sort of official plan amendment application that's um, driven by by staff. Um, go out for public opinion, get that, and then bring it forward and and put it into the the current official plan as an official plan amendment. So there is that opportunity. It's, you know, that that itself is going to take some time. Um, so it might only be in play for you know a month or two uh, until the July date comes around. So that the word "easy" probably uh, easy application probably doesn't apply here. Yeah, it, it, I, 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 you know, I, I don't see how we get around not having any sort of public consultation. Just. Okay. You know, just grabbing it and throwing it into the new official or the current official plan. I think a uh, bit of know. a stress. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a, a hypothetical question, I guess, is if um, a piece of property was obtained and the wrong designation was put on it. Uh, in the past, does the official plan 
address that or how does how would somebody go about to have that designation taken off so it'd be an open space which on private property i'm just wondering how it shouldn't have been on there in the first place but i'm just wondering how somebody would does, does this address that uh, it can be done two ways counselor um it can be done uh first and foremost by the the, the actual property owner uh, going through the official plan amendment process, or it can be done as a cleanup bylaw through staff. You know, sometimes we we find mapping errors that, you know, the the line is just moved a little bit too far, um, so that we then we pull it back in through uh, it was called an omnibus bylaw. So whenever we find these anomalies, we kind of try and package them together provide some justification to council as to why we're, we're, we're recommending a change. And then as council, you get to determine whether or not you accept the change. So it, it could be, it could go both ways. It depends on the urgency for the, the property owner. If they, they have something they want to do immediately, then um, probably the official plan amendments, the way to go. And then perhaps ask council for a refund on the, the, uh, on the fees. Um, or they can wait for a little bit until we uh, sort of get three or four of anomalies that we that we see, whether it's in the zoning bylaw or the OPs or the secondary plans, and bring forward that to council. Or, and, I, and I know we do have a few, and I, I believe uh, we do want to bring something forward over the next couple of months. Okay, I'm going to do that. Thanks. Okay, any other questions about section five? No, okay. So we've got, um, Madam CIO, we've got by my count, what, three items we have to consider? Oh, I, I have more than three. Um, uh, so uh, we have a motion uh, potential motion. So what we'd like to do, what I'd like to do is confirm that these are in fact the motions you want to bring forward. And then we would uh, take a break and Mike and Chad and I can um, uh, confirm the wording that we've been drafting uh, separately during this conversation and then read back to you what we think the motions are, confirm with the uh, movers and seconders vote, and then uh, see if we can end this. So um, uh, so I would uh, just, Chad, do you have the complete list or do I need to read it? Through the, through the mayor, I have the complete list. Why don't, why don't you just read the, the not the motions, but the uh, intent, the, the items. intent, the yep. items so we can confirm they're all on the list. So we, we have one from Councillor Hirsch regarding wetlands. Um, yep. We have a second one from Councillor Margitson in regards to the transition policy. Uh, we have a third from, we have another one from Councillor Hirsch about the setbacks. We have a motion from Councillor St. Jean about section 4.3.1.2. We have one from Councillor Maynard where we removed the sentence about prioritizing municipal services, infrastructure, and tourism in policy 4.1.2. And then we, from Councillor Bailey, we have remove section 4.5.53 and 4 and replace it. Yeah. Okay. And then you craft these, bring them back each yes. one for discussion. Then and we go I, from there. Yes. And through the mayor, I just want to clarify for Councillor Hirsch and, and uh, Councillor Nyman, we would be combining the wetland one and the setback from the Warring Creek. Uh, they were read as separate, but we're contemplating putting those together. Okay. Uh, okay, hang on for a minute. Councillor Hirsch, uh, everybody put their on. hand down. I, I had one. I had one more, and I don't know. It, it wasn't a section. It's in the maps. And uh, uh, Mike Michaud is aware of, of this one on the on the Schedule B map, which shows um, natural core areas and linkages and identifies uh, wetlands, provincially significant wetlands and so on. And I'm not sure how to tell you where it is in the package because I don't seem to find it, but you know, the colored maps at the back. Um, we've had a discussion uh, with um, 
Mr. Michaud about the Slab Creek Provincially Significant Wetland, which has been recognized by um, MNRF as a provincially significant wetland, and we think should be should belong to Natural Core Area E, and probably a linkage then drawn from there to um, the coastal provincially significant wetland to the left. There just hasn't been time to for staff to get through analyzing that process. So Mike suggested that we add another piece of council direction to the last uh, to the motions. And I provided uh, Chad and, um, and Mike and the CEO with a text that reads something like the council directs staff to conduct a review of the Slab Creek Provincially Significant Wetland for consideration as part of Natural Core Area E and potential linkage to Coastal Provincially Significant Wetland in advance of 2023 for consideration of a future official plan amendment. In other words, it would be lumped with the shoreland study and the cultural heritage study as, as things that staff is taking on to do. So I'm not sure where you structure that, but the CEO has that text and so does Chad and that can be part of the package then. Yep. Okay, with you, ma'am, CEO. Yes, we'll add it to the list for discussion and voting. Okay. Okay, Councillor St. Jean. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to, to the CAO or the clerk, will you be posting each of these uh, motions on the uh, big screen, as we'll call it? Yes, or are you going yes. to email? Okay. We'll, that way we'll we can both. see it and we'll the public both. can see yeah. it. That's right. We'll, okay. we'll email you the version and then we'll screen share as we vote. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Councillor Margitson. My question's been answered. Thank you. Councillor Maynard. Thank you. Um, just for clarification, um, Councillor Hirsch, are you talking about the map schedule B natural features and areas and trying, is that the, the map that has, is going to potentially have another um, undefined, uh, it's, you're looking to put a corridor in there. So I have some, and, and I'll just say in general, some of what we've been doing, I don't think is overly, has been <clears throat> totally transparent that uh, without, you know, without the public really getting a, a look at the, uh, the, final, the final draft, I, I don't know how we can change a map. Like we already know that these uh, core areas and, and linkages are um, in their, how they are defined on the maps is suspect. How do we then try and make a determination where tonight in a meeting, make a determination where that, uh, where that is? I, like I haven't. Hey, well, Councillor well, Hirsch brought this up. So I'll let Councillor Hirsch respond. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking for the change to be made tonight to be voted on. What we're asking for since staff has indicated that it's worth looking into, we're just asking for direction for staff to to, to do that because it's this designation of, of the Slab Creek uh, wetland as provincially significant is fairly recent and would not have been considered when the original consultant um, was, was drawing the natural core areas. And we think that it, um, it rightly belongs there. Staff hasn't had an opportunity yet to look at that. So this motion simply asks staff to have a look uh, and to come back to us in sometime in the next two years. Uh, to see if we want to amend the map based on on real information. That's all. If if we if I could though, I would like to before I even vote on that, I'd like to at least have that map brought up and have a rough idea of exactly what it is that we're we're looking at. I didn't think we would actually get to the point of um, amending maps because there's a rather large uh, natural uh, linkage in the uh, carrying place area that I think is probably. Um, overstated so i think the motion should be that we look at all of our natural core areas and uh, linkages for uh, for verification because uh, but anyways i i would like to see that exactly if somebody can bring the map up and draw a quick line where where the intention okay. is council McGon.
You're on mute. Thank you. Uh, going back, I had lost something. There is something I would like to include for consideration, which is a language change on page 53. Um, so under section 3.3.3.3.3. So bottom of page 53. Um, so, and this relates to a conversation that councils had recently that the conversion or demolition of existing rental apartments in, in buildings with more than four rental apartment units to condominium, et cetera. I, I would like to propose that that actually gets altered to uh, conversion or demolition of existing rental units in proposed developments or something along those lines. Um, so, and I can um, okay, if, well, we're, we're now going backwards here. We are, but that's, uh, I still want to discuss. That's, we've already, you know, it's a big book. Councillor McNaughton, can you repeat the section? I can. So, so page it's 53. page 53. <laughs> Jinx. It's on page 53 at the bottom. So, and under 16, it's 16 E. And I can, have you got it? So, uh, and the change I would be looking for would be, uh, would be changing um, units in buildings to, or sorry, apartments in buildings to units in proposed developments or units within a proposed developments um, boundaries or something to that effect. So just to be clear, if you're removing, you've got to add in. Hmm? Yeah, I believe if, you're saying to remove the language uh, related to apartments and buildings and, and add language that makes it broader. I, I understand, we'll, we'll write Thank something. you. Okay, all right. Okay, Madam CAO and um, Mr. Planning Manager, you're, you're okay with this and, and Chad? How much time do you need? 10 minutes, 15? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I got an urgent um, email from Mr. Mark Tao, who, as you know, was uh, the planning consultant associated with Mr. DeMello's yeah. deputation. Um, he, in, in, the abs in the absolute cautiousness of, of his particular client's application, he would like the transition policy, policy to speak to two studies uh, referencing both um, EISs and hydro G's. Hydro G's being a hydrogeology study. I don't know if yeah. Councillor Marguson, if you want to amend your motion to-, to Well, I for that, thank, but... thank you, Michael. I, I noticed that it was, to be honest, I noticed it was only one report and so applications that are missing reports based on seasonality, yeah. um, so, would that give you the discretion to, to make a decision okay. on what's missing? Like it's EIS was just an example you gave. It yeah. could have been hydrogeology, it could have been archeology, span but I'm suggesting that perhaps reports and then yeah. staff make hey. that, just, yeah. Is that agreed? Can I, yeah, okay. Can I, can I uh, ask for a point of order, for a point of clarification? So we had our comments from the audience. And while I appreciate that this is a, is a, a work in progress, we now have a comment coming through a text to our, uh, to our manager of planning that is, um, that is uh, massaging the wording of a motion. And, Motion. you know, that's, um, you know, although I appreciate the, uh, the engagement, I just think that that has not been afforded to all. Not everyone has the, um, the cell number that they can text our uh, manager of planning. So again, I will go back to one of my, my main concerns with this process so far that the vocal minority has, uh, 
has had an, to me, undue influence on this plan and uh, at the expense of the, uh, of the less vocal or the unheard uh, majority of the people in this county. I just find that, you know, in itself a little troubling that we would be considering a comment at this stage through a text to our manager of planning. Yeah. Councillor Maynard, I think the, uh, the, the point about the intrusion from the, the deputy is appropriate. And I, I, Highly inappropriate. I, I don't think it's um, you know, appropriate to consider. So staff and the CAO will take that under advisement as they go and work through this, um, uh, these motions. So again, Madam CAO, how much time for the recess do you think? Uh, probably t 10 minutes, but why don't we say 15? So for sure. Okay. So we'll take a 15 minute uh, recess. So 940, so 955. We'll be back. Okay. We're recessed. Ernie, are you there? I am. In yes, the, with this, in the spirit of, if you know better, you often do better. Just, just to, on the Bill, if I, if I could interrupt, I'm not sure if uh, this is on YouTube Please or not live. at this point. Just so you're aware. We are okay. Live. Yes. Yes, you're live. I guess I guess we'll we'll chat about it when we get back.
Mayor, uh, the clerk is just running back upstairs uh, to restart and you have all been sent the draft that we will then show on the screen. Uh, by email? Yes. Okay. All righty, I'll find the email. <clears throat> Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, six items. Okay. They're also in the order they were given. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> and I'll second Steve, I'll second Maynard's motion. All righty. Your Worship, I'm ready. Are we live on air? Yep. Is everybody back? There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. We'll call the meeting back to order. Uh, we've got, did everybody receive the email from the CAO containing six uh, motions, presumably, okay. So Madam CAO will go through these one at a time and and uh, ask for any questions. So I, uh, sorry through the mayor, sorry to interrupt you, but I forgot the housing one that uh, Councillor McNaughton asked for, but it's uh, fairly simple uh, to do. So I will add, I'll work on that separately while you are talking about these. Yeah, and that'll be the concluding one. Okay. <clears throat> so, Mr. Clerk, we've got um, okay. So the first uh, the first motion we have is a Hirsch Nyman motion. The council directs staff to replace thirty meter with fifty meter for setbacks from wetlands defined as wetlands hyphen other in policy three point one point four section two and from the Waring's Creek uh, in policy 3.1.4 um, clause 16. Are there any questions about this? I can't I can't see anybody's image with this on screen so are there any questions about this one? Comments? Okay then I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Hands up so I can count, please. <clears throat> One, two, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, ten, and that carries. Thank you. <clears throat> so we'll move to item two, 
this is a Maynard motion that is going to be seconded by Councillor Margotson. Um, Councillor Maynard, can you read this? Can you see it? You're muted. Sorry. Can I get the uh, screen view if I'm going to read it? Sorry. Well, or somebody can read it for me. Wait, wait, why don't we... I'll, I'll read the motion and um, thank you. That way I can see who, if anybody has questions. So, okay, this is a Maynard Margotson motion that council directs staff to remove the sentence villages are intended to prioritize municipal services, infrastructure, tourism, and amenities, and amenities for tourists and businesses catering to tourists in policy 4.1.2 and replace with. Quote, villages are intended to prioritize municipal services, infrastructure, and commercial businesses, end quote. Is that okay with you, Councillor Maynard, Councillor Margotson? Yes. Um, okay. Is Councillor Maynard okay? I, yes. I would have, I would have, I would have preferred um, villages are intended to prioritize municipal services, infrastructure, and small scale commercial uses. Perfect. Thank you, Councilor Markinson. Small, Marketson. small scale commercial uses as opposed to commercial businesses. Correct, thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Clerk, have you got that? I have it, yes. Okay, so the motion, we'll vote on the motion as amended. Yeah, yes. Okay. Any oh, questions? It's a friendly. It's a friendly, so it's not yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. Any questions? Okay. Now I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Hands up, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That carries. Thank you. <clears throat> Move to the third one. This is a St. Jean. Um, motion, but there is no seconder at this point. Councillor St. Jean? I see Councillor Bailey. Bailey. Councillor Bailey is seconding this. Okay, so I will read it. The council directs staff to eliminate policy 4.3.1.2 um, bracket 20I, which regulates tourist development activities by season with the understanding that this is already restricted by uh, environmental compliance approvals for septic systems by the province. Any questions? Councillor Forrester. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I'm not quite sure it's a good idea to remove that clause in there. Uh, it has been brought up quite a few times that this is quite important and we can't just assume that it will be restricted by environmental compliance on the aseptic system because there are campgrounds and resorts up north that do run fourth seasons that actually remove some of their people for a month just for, for certain rules out there, but they'll actually put them in up in hotels for a month. I don't think that's something we want to get into down here. So anyway, just a thought, I would consider leaving that in there. It doesn't hurt. We don't have any of the resorts in that situation right now. so. I'll leave it up to everybody else. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I will call the vote. All those in favor, please. Show of hands. Um, one, two, three, four in favor. Opposed? Show of hands, please. Three. So that motion fails. <clears throat> okay, so we'll move to the next motion, which is Councillor Bailey. I will. I will second that, uh, Mr. Mayor Hirsch. Okay, Councillor Hirsch will second this, and the motion reads: that Council directs staff to remove Section Four Point Five Point Five. 
uh, bracket three and bracket four and replace with the same wording found in 4.5.4 bracket three to restrict major development in natural linkage areas to the same degree as in natural core areas. Everybody, that okay with you? Councilor, okay. <clears throat> Questions? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Show of hands, please. That's five in favor. Can I, those opposed? Show of hands, please. Six opposed, so that, uh, that fails. Okay. The uh, second last one, this is Councillor Margitson. And is there a seconder for this, Councillor Councillor Roberts? <clears throat> of course. The council directs staff to remove policy 5.2.4, uh, clause one and replace with, quote, application submitted and deemed complete before July 6, 2021 shall be reviewed under the existing 2006 official plan. Applications that are missing one report based on seasonality, i.e. EIS, may also be reviewed under the existing 2006 official plan subject to the applicant submitting an application or applications containing all the other required reports, documents and fees such that it could be deemed complete subject to the missing report. Councillor Margitson and Councillor Roberts, that okay with you, what I read? Okay, questions? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Show of hands, please. And that carries. <clears throat> this is a Councillor Hirsch motion. Um, we need a seconder, Councillor Hirsch. For this, Councillor Bailey, a, ba a Hirsch Bailey motion, the council directs staff to review and consider including the Slab Creek provincially significant wetland as part of natural core area E and potential linkage to coastal provincially significant wetland for consideration in a future official plan amendment no later than 2023. That okay with you, Councillor Hirsch and Bailey? Okay, questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Maynard had asked if, if we could perhaps indicate where that is on the map. I will attempt to share my screen here. Okay. I've not done this on the iPad before, so bear with me. Is anybody seeing that? No. 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 Seeing, a, seeing the logo for the South Shore Joint Initiative. Okay. <laughs> then I don't know how to do it. Can I speak to that, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just ahead. wanted to, to say that the, the uh, Schedule B and A3 have both been updated to show the Slab Creek wetland as provincially significant by color coding. So if you look at those schedules, you will see where the wetland is just east of the village of Hillier, or Hamlet, sorry, Hamlet of Hillier. Um, so that part of the work has been done and this motion just uh, asks staff within the next two years to determine whether it is actually a natural core area. So I hopefully that helps Councillor Maynard to, to, sh to show you where it is on the schedules. Okay. Councillor Maynard, question? Sorry, just for, just for clarification. Yeah, so I do, 
I, I was able to kind of, so is it just the, the core area or is it the linkage, which would likely then right run, go through the, uh, right through, tell you these maps are, I don't have my, my old big map. So I, uh, I'm a little bit visually challenged here. Is that what they're proposing that it goes from there over to the, to the one to the west? Councillor uh, Hirsch, as well as Let, the, let's let like, Councillor Margotson can provide an answer. Yes, in speaking with Miss Bodman, um, mm -hmm. they're looking to see, and and this would be evaluated within this motion, if if there is a, a potential for a linkage between the Pleasant Bay wetland um, down through Slab Creek. But it, you're correct, it does go through um, the hamlet of Hillier and it may be determined that that linkage is not viable. Um, so, but that's, the, that's what this study or investigation would determine. Correct, okay. All right, other questions about the motion? Okay, seeing none, I will call the vote. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And that motion carries. Okay, Madam CAO, you have the um, the last item that yes, uh, Councillor uh, McNaughton brought forward. Uh, Chad, can you screen share so people can see that? Yes, just give me one second to open my email again. I'm working on two computers here and I closed the email from the Zoom. Apologize. Councillor McNaughton, I sent it to you directly via email. Thank you, I'll have a look. I'm sharing my screen now. <clears throat> Thank you. That does represent oh. it. Um, Is it so can everybody see this? I will take that as a yes. May I speak to it? If you can't see me? Well, I can, I can see you. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, go ahead. Uh, I, I would support if staff would be more comfortable uh, including the phrase um, or provide or provide an adequate or, a, or provide a comprehensive accommodation plan to replace those units. I don't know if that's useful or not. I would leave that to staff. And CAO or Michael, what do you think? Or and provide. And or. Wait for staff to respond. What section is this again? This is the. My apologies. No, that's fine. It's um, section it's, fifty-three. It's on page fifty-three. Page fifty-three. Section three point three point three. Just for clarity uh, through the mayor to Councillor McNaughton. So the way it's drafted here, this is achieving um, clarity that it, it doesn't have to be a rental apartment or a condo or a short-term accommodation, but basically any four units being converted or uh, demolished 
Um, and it's a prohibition against that unless we have a 3% vacancy. What you're now talking about is adding, uh, I would put it at the end of the sentence, end of the paragraph there, uh, would only be considered if the annual CMHC vacancy rate is 3% or higher, or um, there is a comprehensive, uh, there is a comprehensive replacement plan. Yeah. That works for me as well. Okay. Um, Thank you. I'll any other it. question? I'm sorry. Who was the seconder? Margitson will second that. Okay. All right. Any other questions from members of council? Okay. Call the vote. All those in favor of the motion. Hands up, please. One, two, four. And that carries. Terrific. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so we are, um, Madam CAO, at this point, we have walked through the, um, the table oh. of contents of the plan. Yes. Yeah, so now you have the, the motion as amended or proposed to be amended by Michael in his presentation. Um, so that's the main motion with all of the changes that you've just also voted on is what um, I think you, so I think you need to next vote on the changes that Michael proposed in the wording of his motion. And then you can do one more vote for all of it as amended. Chad, is that correct? Okay. Yes. Okay, Chad, if you could, uh, what I'd like you to do uh, is to read the motion so we're absolutely clear on what we're, we're uh, talking about, see if there's any discussion, then we'll vote. Could we also have it on the screen to uh, let us visualize it for, <laughs> for a minute? Sure. Michael, can you quickly email that to me? Michael, did you get that? My presentation? Is that, is that what you want, Chad? Yes, the recommendation. I just don't have it in front of me right now. Okay, hold on. While we're waiting, Mayor Ferguson, could, could I just say something? Um, you, go ahead, Councillor Roberts. Yeah, it's 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 very personal. I mean, <clears throat> uh, folks that were around the horseshoe in the last council will remember that getting this new official plan was something of a of a personal campaign. And I often joke that I wasn't quite sure I would live long enough to see it happen. Um, and for folks that are you know, still hanging in with us on Facebook. It's nearly been wondering why this is such a long process and detailed process. It's been, you know, nearly 30 years uh, since this original official plan was adopted back in 90, 1993, even before amalgamation. And it's, it was way over its best before date, you know, 15 years ago. And uh, for the folks that, paying attention are history buffs. Um, this project, as it, it's come to fruition tonight or will come to fruition tonight, actually began in 2010 and the intention was to have it done by April of 2016. So um, it's a big, from, from my perspective, it's a big, big congratulations to Marcia and Mike and uh, the staff and stakeholders and council and the public. It's just, just incredible, and uh, it's, I'm really proud of what we've accomplished, so thanks. Okay. Okay, we've got, um, we've got the resolution in front of us. Uh, this was moved and seconded, um, I believe. Chad, who, who were the movers and the seconders of this? 
Uh, it was a bailout through the mayor. It's a Bailey Roberts motion. Okay. Can everybody see the uh, what's on the screen? Yeah, just give us a minute. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, through the mayor, just to be clear, so when this would get finalized, all of the uh, additional motions that were passed tonight would get inserted in probably uh, between three and four and then that would be the final package that uh, represents what gets decided tonight okay your worship may I ask a question and with the uh, with the uh, resolution still before us on the screen um, and number yeah let, let's let, let's keep the uh just a second, Councillor Man. Yeah. Just, uh, Chad, if you could keep the resolution on the screen and if members of council want to ask a question or comment, just to identify themselves because I can't see the, I, the resolution and members of council to see hands up. So go ahead, Councillor Maynard. So number three, where it says, council approved the official plan and the changes as mentioned within the PowerPoint presentation on February 24, 2021. Well, uh, how how will that motion hold up over time, right? Because you know it doesn't like which changes as mentioned within the PowerPoint presentation. I'm I'm just looking for clarity, not only for myself, but for the uh, but most importantly for the uh, for the for the public. Understood. I think the um, well, let, we'll let the manager of planning respond because it was his presentation but i think i know what the response will be go ahead mike yeah councilor mayor is correct there's been a, a number of uh, changes uh to what's been presented um i'm not quite sure how we capture those those changes although i believe well are you referring we, to the technical changes Sorry to interrupt, but uh, maybe we say this uh, as sorry as changes as mentioned within the PowerPoint pre presentation. Um, save and accept those that have been amended by council resolution or by motion of council. Well, I think what what I am seeing is the the page that refers to technical changes, and there are number of bullet points with um, you know small adjustments to languages language um, the transition policy doesn't apply so if we can apply some specificity to the contents of the PowerPoint presentation I think that would satisfy uh, counselor counselor Maynard um, so I'm just looking through all these now. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Kirk. May I suggest changing the language to the council approve the official plan and the changes as mentioned within the attachment draft official plan proposed changes at the February 24th, 2021 meeting? Uh, well, <laughs> you just Through the mayor, me. there's another option. We could uh, just um, import all of the changes as an uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G kind of list below item three. I think so, that would be that would be the cleanest way to do it. Yeah. Good idea. Is that okay with you, Councillor Maynard? Yes, because this written motion will uh, will stand long after. The PowerPoint yeah, no. presentation is buried somewhere. <laughs> so let's let's put the specifics in as per the uh, the PowerPoint presentation, so the uh, the public can see what we've uh, agreed to and refer back to it. <clears throat> do you want to do that now, Chad? Yeah, to the mayor. Yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll do it right now. Okay. 
Just give me this. I just got to parse through the presentation. I will. So Chad, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you. Almost there. to share my screen. Can everyone see this? Yeah, if you could, um, can you scroll up so we can see what leads into it? Okay, sorry. Um, let me just get the... Chad, maybe just say, and the following changes and take off the mention of the PowerPoint. Uh, 
Okay, and that refers to the maps 13, 14, and 15. Okay. <clears throat> so, Chad, everything included in the PowerPoint presentation is now listed there. Yes. Okay, Mike, can you the... verify that? <clears throat> Scroll up, Chad, please. That's everything. Okay, so that duplicates exactly what was presented at the first part of the meeting that was uh, that the uh, public had access to, correct? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Today. All right. So we've got a uh, much longer motion now that includes these uh, these components. Are there any other adjustments to the motion that need to be made before I ask for discussion? Suspense is killing me. <clears throat> well, you're quite right, Councilor Roberts. You've been championing this, this plan for quite some time, certainly through the last term of council. So a couple more minutes. and I don't mind saying it. I'm going to hit the brown liquor. Is it done, Chad? Yes. Okay, so as I say, everything that motion and uh, all the amendments, everything the public saw and we, we saw at the beginning of the meeting is now included in the motion, correct? Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> we've got the, uh, the amended motion 
comments, please. Councillor Bailey. Before we get there, Your Worship, it being my motion, I'd like a recorded vote, please. Other, uh, other questions, comments before I call the vote? Seeing Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, much work has been done However, I feel that it is possible for us to do much better. Um, we are a community of communities and different things can work in different areas. I am not comfortable, <clears throat> sorry, with this guiding document for many reasons. In my opinion, it does not align with the vision of most of the constituents whose voice I represent, or in fact, our own strategic uh, plan in many ways. Mm. Especially uh, both in the, the near and the long term. Also during a year of COVID restrictions and the inability to have in-person public consultation sessions has, in my opinion, precluded meaningful input from many residents, those that I will call the silent majority. I include in this that the final draft of this meeting was updated to council last night and to the general public today. And to me, that just underlines the fact that uh, we don't have to go fast to go far, that there is still work to be done. And it is with regret that I will stand and say that I cannot support this official plan as written. Okay, okay thank you. Councillor Bolick. Yes, good evening. I appreciate that a lot of work has been put into this proposed official plan. And there is an axiom that better is the enemy of good enough. Unfortunately, this plan is premised on presumptions as to where development should occur that I believe are wrong. I am therefore left with the conclusion that this plan isn't good enough. It's not only bad for the county, it's terrible for Ameliasburg. It does not recognize that different areas of this county have disparate needs and realities. It is a product that fails to incorporate a true understanding of all areas of this county and certainly not the needs and wants of Ameliasburg residents. Residents of Ameliasburg Ward ask for very little from this municipality, but they receive even less. Unfortunately, this is not new. It goes back to amalgamation 20 plus years ago. And my constituents are tired of bankrolling experiments and mistakes in other areas of this county. With the only thing to show for it, roads so poor that they must regularly shell out hundreds and even thousands of dollars to repair damage to their vehicles. I was elected on a platform of providing a voice at Shire Hall for those in this ward. I remember the excitement and energy that this council exuded two years ago. Things were going to be different. That has now dwindled to a case of paralysis by analysis. We declare emergencies and then ignore them. We have endless special meetings where very little gets achieved. We spin our wheels. We lurch from one crisis to another. We ended up with a budget that is essentially the status quo we've seen for decades. This council aspires to fixing all that ails the world, but we can't even figure out how to fix our roads. Roads that all our residents use all the time. And now we are being asked to approve a plan that caters to tourism and tourists. Those activities may be part of the county's future, but they have little positive relevance to those of us in the Northwest. For Ameliasburg, single tier governance has been an abject failure. This draft plan is a perfect example of that. <clears throat> I can only conclude that it is now time to work toward 
extricating Amiosburg Ward from the unwieldy and unworkable municipal structure with which we are currently saddled. As I already stated a number of weeks ago, I cannot nor will I support this plan. And I certainly support Councillor Bailey's call for a recorded vote. That's how I feel. Thank you, Councillor Bolick. Other questions or comments, please, about the motion? Is there anybody that uh, has anything? Okay, I want to um, I want to acknowledge, and Councillor Hirsch did this right off the bat. Um, the extraordinary amount of work that went into creating this document. Um, that for those unaware has, I will use the word languish uh, because I think it's appropriate for years and years and years. And I think the, uh, the way this has moved forward is um, it's unfortunate that we are in a position now with uh, in the midst of a pandemic that may go anywhere. Um, that has had an effect on the ways in which we have, um, you know, put this information out to the public. That said, the information has been out there for quite some time. And I think the plan, in my opinion, uh, and I had to ask myself several questions as I went through this and like everybody else went through it um, you know, on numerous occasions in different drafts. Does the plan respect the many reasons that we choose to live in Prince Edward County while recognizing at the same time that change is inevitable, but that change must be imp implemented respectfully um, uh, and appropriately, the you know as as we've also gone through it and considered the plan and all its components, I paid and, and I'm sure all of you did paid particular attention to whether the plan and the details of the plan adhere to the vision, <clears throat> excuse me, vision for the future, as articulated in in uh, section two point three. And if there was any deviation from, from that vision, that uh, those comments, you know, in many cases were brought forward tonight and, and addressed appropriately by members of staff. Does the plan, um, another question was, does the plan respect the county's historical roots, its agricultural heritage, um, and to ensure appropriate protection is in place for those as well as the natural environment. Uh, I think it's, you know, I think we've, we've gone through a long struggle and uh, going through a lot of analysis about this and the plan and doing what is appropriate for everyone in Prince Edward County. So I am, I am in support of it. Um, the, as I say, the amount of work that went into it on the part of new staff members, um, the CAO and the manager of planning, as well as many, many other individuals who are relatively new to employment in the county have done a, a terrific job bringing this forward. And I want to express my appreciation, not only to the CAO and the manager of planning, but also others that um, were involved in, in the process. And I hope, hope that appreciation on the part of council will be expressed appropriately to staff. So that said, I'm going to call the vote and um, Councilor, Councilor um, Bailey wants a recorded vote. Are there any other questions? Councilor Roberts, is that a question? I just, uh, can you hear me? Yep. It just came across that I was muted. Well, you know, perfection is the domain of the gods. It's not for ordinary mortals like us. Sure, uh, there could be things that might have been improved, but um, that's, not, that's not for us. 
and this is a darn good new official plan. It's contemporary, it's thoughtful, it's inclusive, and in many ways, it's very compassionate. And so if faced with the choice of the politics of pushing apart or the politics of pulling together, I wholeheartedly endorse the latter. Um, the world is too conflicted, too confused, and too bitter in a lot of ways. And that bitterness is only fueled by division. So um, I'm really proud that we've got this done. I'm really proud of our staff. And I'm proud of the public from all over Prince Edward County that contributed to its success and to its authorship. So um, I'm happy to have a recorded vote. Okay, Chad, if you could uh, roll through this, please. Uh, Councillor St. Jean. Point of, order. Favor. Point of order. Uh, it should start with Councillor Bailey. He's the one that called the recorded vote. That's yeah. that for the procedural bylaw. Thank you, Councillor Nunn. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. <laughs> In favor. Councillor St. Jean. In favor. Councillor Bullock. He's muted. Okay. Councillor Bullock. To un unmute. Go back to Councillor Bullock. Councillor Forrester. You lo looking for me? Yeah, Councillor Bullock. In favor or opposed? Opposed to. Councillor Forrest. Forrester. In favor. Councillor Harper. In favor. Councillor Hirsch. In favor. Councillor McNaughton. In favor. Councillor Margetson. In favor of. Councillor Maynard. Opposed to. Councillor McMahon. Opposed to. Councillor Nyman. Opposed to. Councillor Prinzen. In favor. Councillor Roberts. In favor. Mayor Ferguson. In favor of. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten in favor and four opposed. Okay. Thank you. So we'll move on the agenda to item number nine, confirmatory bylaw. Could I have a mover and a seconder for this, please? Councillor St. Jean, seconded by Councillor Margetson. Thank you, Your Worship. This is a St. Jean Margetson motion that the following bylaw be read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. A bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the County of Prince Edward at the special meeting held on February 24th, 2021. Thank you. All those in favor, please show of hands. And that carries. So we'll move to item 10 adjournment and motion to adjourn. Moving a seconder for that, please. Councillor Prinzen, seconded by Councillor, a Councillor, Councillor Harper. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a Prinzen Harper motion that this special meeting now adjourn at 10.48 p.m. Thank you very much. All those in favor? Thanks. Just before we go, I know it's been a long evening, but... Uh, uh, you know, we, we had to get this done. So we will see everybody tomorrow afternoon. Too bad we can't go for a refreshment and- uh, Who and, says we and, can't? And, and, and shake hands, everybody. <laughs> 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 yeah, see this is everybody. what so is nice. Yes. It's well within reach right now. <laughs> Zoom drinks in the other window. <laughs> coffee, coffee see. is not it. <laughs> We'll see everybody tomorrow. Thanks for attending those tuning in via YouTube.